I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief. It's the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolios. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. Happy Thursday, everyone, but the end of the trading week as well. We're winding things down for this quarter. Futures are mixed this morning as booming first quarter 2024 comes to a close here. Take a look at the mixed activity here at the Dow and the S&P. Green, NASDAQ futures. Oh, just barely trickling into the green here. We're going to continue to track that. The S&P and the NASDAQ, though, up around 10% so far year to date. Data out this morning showing that once again, the U.S. economy is still growing at a strong pace. The final rating of fourth quarter GDP was revised higher to an annual pace of 3.4 percent. And later on today, we will get the latest reading on consumer sentiment as well as pending home sales. So let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Jared Blickery and Jennifer Schomberger have more. Hey, Shauna, stock futures are searching for direction this morning as markets are set to close out their best first quarter in five years. The first three months of the year have brought a broadening to this stock market rally with what largely started as a mega cap driven surge in stocks has extended to energy and materials to close out March. Plus, the Fed's path to rate cuts. Federal Reserve Governor Chris Waller says he's in no hurry to cut interest rates after hotter inflation data in the first two months of the year. The data-dependent Fed, they still expect rate cuts this year, but they're not ready to take that step without further evidence that inflation continues to drop. And Sam Bankman Freed, former CEO of failed crypto exchange FTX, set to be sentenced today by Manhattan federal judge after a jury found him guilty last fall on seven charges, including a wire fraud, conspiracy, securities fraud, and money laundering. Bankman Freed faces up to 110 years in prison. Prosecutors have asked for 40 to 50 years. Bankman Freed's lawyers have requested six and a half years. Well, happy Thursday. Our top story this morning, markets, they are set to close out their first quarter, the best first quarter in years here. Let's take a look at some of the quarter's market action. First and foremost, we got to pull up the futures activity. We had pointed that out just a moment ago, but taking a look at the Dow futures, you're seeing that higher by about one-tenth of a percent. We'll be generous and round that off to eight-hundredths of a percent if you want to be a stickler out there. But year-to-date, we're taking a look at a move higher there of about five and three-quarters percent. So we'll We'll continue to go back to the actual Dow and show you that in a second here. NASDAQ futures, though, you're seeing that point to the downside right now. It's been hyper oscillating, waffling, whatever you want to call it. It's been moving between positive and negative territory. The S&P 500, though, you're seeing that firmly in positive territory year to date. That's up 10 percent, a little bit more than that. And here at the gate this morning, it looks like futures are trying to make up their mind as well here. They certainly are, and Brad, if you can hit it over to the heat map, let's take a look at the sector action and what we're seeing play out there, because here you're looking at an intraday basis, but if you take a look at the year-to-date gains and some of the leadership that we have seen since the start of the year, you can see it's a bit of a different mix than what we saw last year. Technology not among the top performers here so far this year. you got communication services, you've got financials, and also energy. Energy was actually a top performer here over the last month. When you take a look at the gains that we saw in just March alone, you can see energy sector up near Nearly 9%. So certainly we have seen much of that buying action within the energy sector. Some of those larger, larger cap energy names when you think of Exxon, Chevron, amongst the leaders within those spaces. And then real quick, flipping over to the semiconductor space, because we certainly have seen some outperformance there. This is on a one-month basis, on a year-to-date basis. We've been talking about the fact that many of these chip stocks really leading to the upside. You got NVIDIA, the massive player within there, up 82% so far this year. Not too far behind us. Some of those smaller cap names when you look at AMD, when you take a look at Taiwan Semiconductor there, Broadcom among the leadership there. And then also, we'd be remiss not to talk about the move that we've seen higher in super microcomputer. That move to the upside here, a huge jump. Take a look at that year-to-date chart. We're looking at gains of 200 and 60% there, Brad. Yeah, if I was like Jared Blickery, I would have had the uh, highlighter so we could circle that. But speaking of Jared Blickery, we've got Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery standing by to take us through Bitcoin and gold, both hitting records this quarter. Jared, take it away. Yes, let's start with the yellow metal first. And we're going to go to the futures. I'm going to check the intraday price action. 
Gold has been surging, but it's not even among some of the top performers. It is on that top row, GC equals F, but I want to point out that palladium, natural gas, uh, Brent crude, all of those are trending higher even than gold. So gold is up 1% to a record high uh, on an intraday basis. I don't think it's there just yet, but should close at a record high. And let's just take a look at the five-year price action. You can see we're caught under this resistance level, broke above, and then just have launched higher from here. So a measured move probably puts us at 2250, and you'll see right now we're at 2235. Now, switching over to the other gold, Bitcoin, uh, let's take a look. We have Bitcoin up half a percent, but it has been surging recently. Let me show you the one month uh, for the month of March, what we have done. Now, we made a record high around, what, 74, 75,000 earlier in the month, and we came down pretty quickly. It was a little bit scary there, but now the Bitcoin uh, asset has found its footing and is knocking on these highs that we saw from earlier in the month. And just to zoom out here and give you the bigger picture, these are the record highs that we overcame. And so Bitcoin has done this pattern historically where it breaches a new high, consolidates for 21 days, and then launches higher. I think that 21 days is just about up. So we'll see if history, if history can finally repeat again here. All right, Jared, thanks so much. Uh, we are nearing the end of the first quarter, which means next week we're going to be beginning, <laughs> beginning Q2 2024. Stocks are near all-time highs, the S&P 500 having its best first quarter performance since 2019. It's on track as well for its fifth straight month of gains here. Here with insight on where the markets might be headed from here, we've got Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer. Hey, Josh. Yeah, Brad. So we talked at the beginning of this week. We had the S&P 500 sitting above 5,200 now. That's essentially most macro strategy teams that we follow as target for the year or above the target for the year that they had initially set. So I went back to a lot of those folks this week and asked simply, where do we go from here? Do we come back down to your target? Do we go up? Where is sort of the likelihood? Most strategists see risk to the upside right now. Binky Chata over at Deutsche Bank said that's the question he's getting the most right now from investors is what are the risks to the upside? And they see the risk to the upside pointing to their bull case at 5,500 right now. And a couple key things that this sort of spans all of the different strategists I talked to that they pointed out, but different sort of base cases. Excuse me, one would be similar data to what you saw this morning, right? With that GDP number getting revised up better than expected growth. You guys were just highlighting the sector moves we've been seeing. If you really sort of strip out and think about what a bet on energy is, a bet on materials, a bet on industrials, we're betting on in economic growth, right? We're betting on the economy there. So markets are sort of pricing in that soft landing pretty aggressively, pricing in a, an economy that's probably growing above a 2% rate. You need data to keep coming in that way, and then maybe you continue to see this broadening and the S&P 500 goes up. Another thing that strategists pointed out, this was a chart from the team over at Deutsche Bank talking about risk appetite, and essentially saying they feel like risk appetite overall right now has more room to run. We've been talking a little bit about meme stocks this week, a little bit about crypto moves, but we haven't gotten nearly the levels that we were at in, say, 2021 from a risk appetite perspective. Right now, strategists feel like that is largely backed in facts, backed in economic data, and backed in increases in earnings. The last one, the last reason some people are saying we could see the S&P 500 go up higher is kind of the the crazy scenario or crazier scenario, we start using that bubble word a little bit, and it would be big tech keeps outperforming, right? We know big tech has high expectations for earnings. At this point, the concern to the upside there would be, what if they keep doing better than we expect? And big tech outperforms, this bubble starts growing, and then at that point, Goldman had estimated we could get to 6,000 on the S&P 500 by the end of the year. Not their base case. <laughs> Important to note, not, not the their base, base case. case. Far from their base case, but certainly it is when you see 6,000, you got to take a look into that call. Yeah. Reason why we talked about it earlier this week. All right, Josh, you just laid out some of those scenarios or some of the cases here for the risk to the upside. Let's talk about the flip side, though, the risk to the downside. Yeah. What does that look like? And the other thing that we should highlight, I wouldn't even call this necessarily risk to the downside. There's risk to the flat side, mm -hmm. right? So let's start with that. Basically, every strategist I talked to, like every strategist you guys talked to on air, said, we could probably use a breather. Like, we've been up for five straight months. If the S&P 500 does nothing in April, investors shouldn't panic. That's sure. sort of the advice. To the actual downside, what could take us lower would be continuations of these sticky inflation readings we've been seeing. We're two months in. You heard Chair Powell's sort of reference. Well, there might have been some seasonal issues in January and February. How's March data come in? That's a big question right now. The other thing would be, Recession, right? What if we finally do get some sort of economic slowing from all of this tightening? That would sort of change the narrative here. 
And then the final thing is, as we talked about with this broadening out that we've had, there is an expectation that the other 493 companies are eventually going to have their earnings bounce back. If that does not happen, yeah. that sort of deteriorates the rally that we've seen in those other sectors. Same could be said for big tech. The earnings expectations are still lofty there. If earnings don't live up to the hype of a market that feels like it's currently priced for perfection, then you could also see moves to the downside. Yeah, any deterioration in the fundamentals obviously could be a huge concern for the market at these current valuation levels. All right, Josh, great stuff, thanks. Well, Fed Governor Chris Waller striking a hawkish tone earlier this week, saying, quote, cutting the policy rate too soon and risking a sustained rebound in inflation is something that he wants to avoid. Well, this comes ahead of data from the Fed's preferred inflation gauge that's out tomorrow. Here to break it down, what we could expect from the market going forward, we want to bring in Ben Amons. He's New Edge Wealth a Senior Portfolio Manager. Ben, it's great to see you. So talk to us just about your view as we look ahead to the second quarter. Clearly, it has been another quarter of outperformance here for the market, the strongest quarter that we have seen in years. How does that set up the S&P, the Dow, many of the broader uh, averages here for the remainder of the year? Yeah, I think, Shanna, that you know, if you look at the GDP data this morning and I drill in it, you see across the board all the strengths. And I always take the first look where I look at is at, at, at government spending. And that's so you know, not only elevated, but steady. That, that to me gives me the confidence like, well, as long as that doesn't change, that the government is slowing down any type of spending that we're seeing coming into the economy, yeah, the rally has scope to broaden. And, and that's what I think the momentum indicators are showing, that if you have 80% of the index over 200-day moving average and you got this sort of momentum in the market and other sectors now lifting higher, like financials or, or energy, trying to catch up with semiconductors, I think it all indicates that this is a year where the economy is not really going to be thrown off its course unless there's an exogenous uh, shark. Now, other than that, it's, it's actually steady as she goes. So I would think we're setting up ourselves at least for the first half of the first quarter with that same spirit. So probably going to see some more rally into these uh, sectors that have lagged the semis. Think also of, of sectors that are influenced by particular names, for example, an automotive that has been really a Tesla-driven story that you could see some, some pick up there because broadening rally means more production, more demand also including for, for sectors like automotives. I mean, Ben, you talk about exogenous shocks. We, we just had a boat hit a bridge, a, a vessel carrying uh, so much in terms of the, the product that was expected to be imported and exported coming into the port of Baltimore as well that now gets redirected at the same time that there's going to be perhaps a labor negotiation later on this year with regard to port workers. I mean, that seems like an exogenous shock is out there, but how much and to what extent could that have a larger ripple effect? Yeah, brother, I think what was what was notable from Waller is that he very diffused that that shock from this you know terrible event that he felt like you know the the Baltimore board having two to three percent of sort of you know uh, impact on 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 traffic in, in coming in and out of the US in terms of, of goods was just negligible and therefore a lot of rerouting to other ports should basically offset any type of negative effect on the supply chain. But the supply chain has always been a very like esoteric complex you know, uh, animal, if you call it that way, meaning like, you know, don't really exactly know the exact chain of events that could take place from here. So clearly this is something that you could put in the category of exogenous, that's unexpected. The market sort of took it in as sort of watching and waiting and only seeing some, some particular stocks sell off on this. So I think we have to see what the ripple effect really will be from here. We have examples of this, as you remember, all the clogging of ships in front of the the, the port of Long Beach or what we've had with, with just the general supply chain disruption globally during COVID or in the Suez Canal, some of it will come in a negative way through the data. So I would expect some of the regional manufacturing data to start showing some of the effect from this event. But I don't think that the bigger picture gets thrown off course from this particular event as, as Waller himself said so. And when you take a look at the uh, recent market action, and I want to point because you had some commentary uh, out earlier this week about some of the buying action that we've seen within meme names, really highlighting this risk on appetite that seems to be back within the market. What does that signal to you just in terms of if we're approaching froth levels or, 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 or what investors need to keep in mind at this point in the cycle? I think we need to keep in mind liquidity in particular because 
we do have an expansionary liquidity environment that is driven by in the system in itself. We have actually had more reserve growth than you would otherwise have expected despite quantitative tightening. And you had so much money on the sideline that's coming back in and finding itself into particular uh, assets or, or even like what we call meme stocks. So suddenly seeing major volumes happening. But that's something to keep in mind of in, that could you know, generate some level of froth. And, and as we know, the moment that that becomes more and more evident, there's going to be caution on the part of others that's saying, okay, the market gets overstretched and I'm starting to turn my portfolio a little bit more defensive. I think that is a dynamic to watch, I think, if we're getting further into the, the second quarter. Clearly, the Fed wants to phase out of quantitative tightening, so it will not necessarily be a sudden liquidity drainage. On the other hand, we have these dynamics on the on the fiscal side, too. As I said, if the spending continues the way it does, liquidity may not necessarily disappear, so it comes really from inside the market. And, and I think this is where the psychology may play up that people view the market at some point being a little too frothy, expressed in meme stocks or crypto or other sort of speculative assets, and people pull a bit back. I think the first start of the second quarter will probably not see that type of psychology coming to, to fruition just yet. I think it seems to be very momentum, you know, sort of jubilous atmosphere in this market right now. Hmm. Spicy, Ben. All right. Ben Amons, who is the New Edge Wealth Senior Portfolio Manager. Thanks so much for taking the time. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Got it. Well, time for today's stock to watch. Walgreens, second quarter revenue beating expectations, but narrowing its adjusted EPS guidance for 2024 amid what they're calling a challenging retail environment. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani has the details here. Hey, Anj. That's right. Of course, their retail environment, not a surprise for those who've been following the story. They've been challenged on the front end for quite some time, and that story continues to put pressure on the company, as we see in this earnings. They did beat estimates with a billion more dollars than estimates with $37 billion coming in. But we also know that uh, some of that came from uh, the majority of that beat, uh, analysts have said, have come from the favorable, favorable tax rate that they got. They've also been doing a lot of scaling back. We know that the new leadership has really been focused on right-sizing what the company is focused on, pulling back on clinical services with shutting down 160 Village MD clinics. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes uh, for the company. Meanwhile, they have seen prescription volumes increase, which is giving investors some hope that uh, the balance act that they're trying to do with this, you know, back to basic sort of focus on pharmacy will continue. All right, Anjali, thanks so much. We got to tell them about the best part too, though. Stay <laughs> tuned for Anjali's interview with Walgreens Boots Alliance CEO Tim Wentworth, 11 a.m. Eastern time. This is the first CEO interview during Wealth. I'm excited. Me too. Yes. Can't wait. All right, great. We're both <laughs> excited. You guys should be excited too. Shauna, what else are we watching? Brad, we're watching a lot because we have a jam-packed hour here, a couple of hours when you include that Walgreens CEO joining us later on in uh, for, on Yahoo Finance this morning. But coming up your way, our executive editor, Brian Sazi, he is going to have a key interview lined up first. He will be bringing us a conversation with GM CEO Mary Barra. That's part of our Lead This Way series. Plus, don't miss his interview with Beyond Meat founder and CEO Ethan Brown. Could the alternative meat company's new products Play investors. That interview coming up at 4 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon. And it's been a rocky first quarter for Tesla shares, but what could the second quarter bring? We want to bring thoughts of one analyst later on this hour. Plus, cocoa pricing is surging to record highs. Where does it go from here? And what does it mean for your favorite chocolate makers? We've got much more on Yahoo Finance on the other side of the break.
Ticker symbol HD tips and kicks off our trending tickers this morning. Home Depot announcing it's buying SRS Distribution. It's an 18 and a quarter billion dollar deal, its largest acquisition ever. The company saying the deal is set to close by the end of this fiscal year. You're taking a look at shares. They're up by about a quarter of a percent. Okay, so not a ton of movement, but again, this is the company making the acquisition. But the fact that it is in positive territory still does signal that investors perhaps do like this deal uh, and the additive that SRS distribution can bring to it as well, because typically the company making the acquisition, you might see their shares moving lower after the announced such a deal of this size. Yeah, that's very important to point out. And I think the reason for that is just because of why they are making this deal. The strategy behind it, similar to what we've heard Home Depot executives say on their most recent earnings calls, they're placing more of a focus here on their pro services side of their business. Because right now, about half of their business is from pros. Half of their business is from the DIY customer, people like myself. But they're making a bigger bet on the pro segment, pushing further there. And this acquisition here of SRS Distribution, the roof supply company, for just around $18 billion really will give them more of a footprint, greater exposure to that pro business, which they are looking to grow now for the quarters to come. Now, in the statement, they're saying that SRS is going to be is going to enable the company to extend its offering to residential specialty trade pros while also better serving renovators and remodelers. So they're looking at it as a win, actually, for both categories. But really, the big beneficiary and where they will see, at likely at least in terms of the immediate reaction from the street, where they will see this payoff at first is in that pro side of the business. Yeah, look, um, I can ultimately really capitalize on what Home Depot's DIY to pro offering is when they finally start selling shipping containers to really satisfy some of my uh, my Pinterest board ambitions out there. The shipping container homes are amazing here, but I imagine that you're a pro DIYer as well out there. So I wouldn't say pro. I, I've got some work to do, but yeah, well, as long I'm, as you're putting yeah, effort yeah, for it. Yeah, I'm putting yeah. effort. Slowly right. making progress. Swaggy. Okay. Hanging things in the house, you right. know. Enormous and, and highly fragmented space, they say. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at another trending ticker. Speaking of homes, let's stick with that theme here. RH, Restoration Hardware, shares climbing higher this morning. After saying that it faced, quote, the most challenging housing market in three decades, but now they expect revenue growth of 8 to 10 percent in fiscal 2024. Clearly, the street excited by that guidance with shares uh, really moving to the upside here ahead of the open. Revenue coming in. $738 million. That was actually slightly below what the street was looking for. So this move in the pre-market is all about that guidance. And in terms of the initial reaction, before we get to the shareholder letter, which is always very entertaining, from RH's CEO, the analyst reaction is a bit mixed because the city is basically making the argument that investors are chasing this expected recovery in housing demand right now. And when you take that into account, with the margin outlook, which is a bit weaker than what the street was expecting. That points to lags in revenue compared to demand trends and also international expansion. So yes, there is a lot to be optimistic about if they are able to reach that 8 to 10% revenue growth that they're modeling for at this point. I mean, you and I were talking about this one at our desk. Such a colorful Always. shareholder letter that we got here. I mean, you got a Picasso reference within this one. Trash the flailing home furniture competitors. Uh, it was really giving kind of like the Mike Jones, back then they didn't want me, now I'm hot, they all own me, which I know you know all the words yes, to do. as well. It was giving those vibes <laughs> for sure here. The company was also talking about the plan to expand the RH ecosystem globally, multiplying the market opportunity to seven, to $10 trillion, one of the most uh, valuable and largest addressed by any brand in the world today, they say. Um, and so 1% share of that global market represents about a 70 to $100 billion opportunity here. I mean, they do certainly lean towards the high value, high cost customer that's out there, which is important to remember because who is still buying homes even in a uh, weekend environment for that? It is some of the wealthiest and most cash-rich households out there. Yeah, certainly. And they also announced a loyalty program uh, several quarters ago, a couple of years ago, actually, at this point, which has proven to be very beneficial here for the company. You buy in, you pay an annual fee, and then you're able to unlock savings across deals and yeah. that, that wouldn't be accessible uh, to others out there. So certainly that has been a proven model here. Whether or not they're able, though, and that's going to help them get to that 10 to 8 to 10 percent growth, in this current housing market, I think a lot of people are questioning that at this point. But again, shares up just about 11 percent. Well, coming up, we are just minutes away from the opening bell on Wall Street. And a tough quarter, though, for Tesla. We will be speaking with an analyst to find out if the EV maker still has some charge left. That's coming up next.
Woohoo! All right, we've got an opening bell on Wall Street and in Midtown Manhattan at Wall Street, at the NYSC, where you've got the bell ring right about now. I think it's already taking place anyway. All right, there it is. All right, yeah, prove me wrong. Well, Colgate Palmolive ringing the opening bell. I think I saw my doctor up on that podium as well wow. there, Dr. Michelle Henry. She was also on the uh, Sarah V Super Bowl commercial there too. So shout out to her. Uh, very effective. I only had to go once. So um, <laughs> got the job done. National dermatologist. Though. There you go. There you go. Great bunch of folks ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ too there. All right, let's take a look at what's trending on Yahoo Finance. All right, let's take a look at some of these trending uh, tickers here. But first, let's take a look at those major averages. We've got the Dow uh, trading just to the upside here at the open, up about 62. You've got the NASDAQ to the downside. The S&P, though, is what you want to watch. We're right around the flat line right now, coming off another record-setting day here. We need to get into account where it closed yesterday. S&P on track for the best quarter that we've seen, best first quarter that we've seen since 2019. So certainly this movement to the upside. And, Brad, flipping it over to some of that sector action. That we're seeing at the open. We are seeing a bit of a mixed picture here, but again, we have energy and real estate leading the way. Energy, a big performer over the last month. Interesting. You've got technology pulling up the caboose out of the gate here on the day, moving down by about a quarter of a percent. But hey, fret not. It's still been a pretty good year to date for the sector, up just a little bit more than 8% as of right now. And we're also taking a look at what's trending beyond Yahoo. Fi well, actually, we're just going to toss things on over to Jared Blickery. He's standing by at the big board. We've been workshopping, if we're going to call it the Wi-Fi Jumbotron or something. We'll get back to you on that, Jared, but we'll toss it to you for now. Thank you. We need a catchy name for that, indeed. Let's go over to our Yahoo Finance training tickers on the big board here. A couple of different issues. Walgreens Fleet Alliance. Now, this is a stock that was until very recently in the Dow. Its performance this year is dismal, down 18%. Um, it did manage to beat on, on, on. Hey, Jared, we're going to jump in real quick here. Uh, we're having a little bit of an audio issue there. We believe you were taking a look at Walgreens Boots Alliance. Of course, we have an interview with the CEO coming up during the 11 o'clock hour. Take a look at shares here. Right now, year to date, they are down by about 18.3%. But here today, off of those earnings that our own Anjali Kamlani was breaking down for us, they are higher by about 2%. Some of the other trending tickers right now, you've got some big cybersecurity action here going uh, taking place with Snowflake. That's higher by about 2% here early in trading, but year to date, you're seeing that down by about 8% or 18% rather. And then you get into some of the crypto space. Dogecoin, my goodness, the, the Shiba Inus out there getting uh, some steam this morning. Getting some steam this morning as well as RH, Research and Hardware, up just about 13% on the heels of their print after the bell yesterday. It's all about guidance as moving shares up about 13%. Let's kick it back over to Jared Blickery. We worked out some of those mic issues. Jared, all what right. are you looking at for us? Yeah, well, let me just go. I think since we're doing the Yahoo Finance, training taker list, I'd be remiss if I didn't hit Dogecoin uh, just because of all the crypto frenzy. And you can see here's the year-to-date chart up 133%. Pretty sure that's besting uh, Bitcoin here. But let's take a look at the five-year chart. You can see it is uh, but a shadow of where it had been. This was the uh, whole GameStop early crypto 2021 era there where a lot of stocks and crypto itself peaked. Uh, so Dogecoin kind of clawing back some of those gains, uh, losses, excuse me. And also taking a look at uh, Home Depot real quickly here. This is a stock that's up, you can see over the last five years, up 102%. Uh, we were talking with an analyst yesterday who liked Lowe's uh, in, re, excuse me, in comparison to Home Depot, but nevertheless, Home Depot up 11% overnight. Now, I do want to check in on some of our leaders and sentiment uh, leaders this week. And here we have over the last four days, let me punch this up. Not going to be surprised to see crypto in the lead. GBTC, that's my crypto ETF, that proxy up 11%. But then you have solar energy. Then you have real estate, uh, excuse me, regional banks. That's KRE. Then you have cannabis, small caps. Haven't even touched on small caps yet. But small caps have been trying to break out of a multi-year multi -year consolidation here. So there's lots of room to go, it looks like, for a lot of these indexes and a lot of these issues, not the least of which is apparently Dogecoin. All right. Yes, indeed. Well, Dogecoin trades, of course all day round. Uh, but for some of the equity markets and for the best quarter that we've seen since 2019, that is set to wrap up Thursday here, 4 o'clock, with all three major indexes trading at record highs. Where do investors go from here to break it down for us? We've got Yahoo Finance's very own Miles Udland. I had to remind him that it, it ends at 4 o'clock here today. Not a second later. Not a second, not later. A second later. Let's not forget. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been an interesting first quarter in that uh, everything people thought was going to happen for the whole year happened all at once. Uh, I think the question, like, you know, where do we go from here? It's like, well, 
I don't know, everyone's ideas happened within, everyone's 12 month ideas were really only three month ideas, but I think there's really three key themes that I know you guys have talked about ad nauseum over the last few weeks. Really, uh, we'll start with stocks. The, the Magnificent Seven becomes the Magnificent Four, mm. almost three. I mean, I feel like we're giving, Amazon like gets some credit, you know, yesterday they come out with the, the AI news, um, but you know, it's really like the three around Meta, NVIDIA, and Microsoft of all companies. Uh, sleepy old Microsoft getting the credit there. The market meeting the Fed, probably the biggest driver of the market this year, you would say. Like overall sentiment, the stuff Jared's talking about, broadening of the rally, regional banks getting involved, some of the meme action. I mean, cannabis is a meme trade. It's like, it's not serious, but those stocks going up 100%, like, there you go. That's something that's only going to happen when spirits are high. That's really about investors coming to meet the Fed. And then the Wall Street catch-up trade is partly on the, the strategist price target. You know, 5,500 now is where we see the street high. We've had um, the team over at Barclays, I think it was late last month, floating 6,000 in an upside scenario. Capital Economics has been talking about 6,500 by the end of next year. Um, everyone's throwing out the biggest price targets they can, but the GDP numbers are an interesting part of it as well. And seeing, you know, the street say, well, we're going to have another year of above trend GDP growth, basically. Um, I think another you know, part of this story, that's given the lag on that data and how that feeds into actual profits. Maybe that's more of a Q2, Q3 story, Q3, Q4 even. Um, but you know, the way that those estimates changed the first quarter was certainly an interesting angle. And then that also lends to the argument that this rotation that we have seen take place in the first quarter out of some of those tech heavy names into where we've seen other leadership when it comes to financials, materials, mm -hmm. industrials, et cetera. You make the argument that the economy is holding up, then you can make the argument that that rotation yep. might have further to run. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you look at small caps on balance, they're more levered to the US economy than the S&P 500. S&P 500 gets about 60% of its revenues from overseas, so you have an international play there. So when you're buying small caps, which by the way, still huge underperformers on an index level relative yeah, to the S&P, um, you, you are saying, you know, you're basically making a bet on the domestic economy. Um, and also I think you're making, not I think, investors are making um, a rates play with, with the Russell as well, in a way that you're not doing that with the S&P. The S&P, on balance, those companies have the kind of financial, uh, let's just say financial resources, the ability within the market to go out and raise capital at more reasonable levels. Russell 2000 type companies often more at the whims of rates, but if investors believe, as they do, that while rates not be, may not be going down as fast as they expected, they're probably not going any higher, mm -hmm. Outlook for Russell 2000 companies to figure out any kind of maturity walls, things like this, and you need to raise additional working capital. Those things can be worked out, you know, in a better way. Which is interesting because we've and Liz Ann Saunders of Charles Schwab has brought this up repeatedly with us. If you're looking at small caps and you want to strip out those unprofitable companies, mm -hmm. the S&P 600 is where they're telling clients to really focus in on some of those small cap plays that could be still apparent within the market right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, you know, it started last year with the discussion of the S&P equal weight, then it became right. small caps. Now you got the S&P 600. Right. Uh, we could go through uh, mid cap 400. You know, we could talk <laughs> about all different kinds of ways to slice it. I think probably that, you know, those companies, let's call it, you know, the Russell, call it the Russell 1000, yeah. right? Companies 500 to 2000, right up to where you get to the Russell 2000. That's an interesting place to play because that's where you get a lot of, you know, very big companies that, you know, brand names that we might know that are probably smaller on a market basis than you would expect, um, but have the kind of ability to both play, you know, use an, an economic expansion to their benefit and find a way to get the rates trade, you know, to be more attractive as you go out um, and needing to raise capital, you know, roll maturities, whatever it is. Um, just kind of financial engineering stuff that you know, it's a little bit above our heads, but it's fine. It's going to be top table talk for Easter. I, I, mean, yeah, I mean, who, 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 wouldn't, who wouldn't want to talk about Poor this kind Arthur. of stuff? Uh, have a deviled egg, and let's talk about some financial. I mean, I, like, it's, fun. it's like, oh, here's how big my S&P price target is. And then you get into the details. Like, oh, my gosh, really? Oh, gosh. Well, really doing this? I'm not doing Easter at your house, that's for sure. All right, Miles, thanks. It's good you're not invited. <laughs> Hey, that's not nice. <laughs> the EV pricing war is heating up. Chinese smartphone company Xiaomi is releasing an electric car that's $4,000 cheaper than Tesla's Model 3. While Tesla, a Wall Street darling not so long ago, it's fell from grace wall is continuing. RBC, Citi, Bernstein, and Oppenheimer are all striking a cautious tone on the stock this week. And with the majority of the street now at a hold rating as one of the worst performers in the S&P 500, 
for the first quarter. How should you, the investor, be looking at Tesla? Here to break it all down, we want to bring in Colin Rush. He's Oppenheimer Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst here. Colin, it's good to see you. So just your reaction to, obviously, this downward move that we've seen in Tesla, not exactly a massive surprise given the trends that we had seen over the last several weeks. But how was Tesla set up now, not only in the current quarter, but looking ahead to the remainder of the year? Yeah, so the, this first quarter is, is setting up to be pretty messy. I think everyone understands that there's seasonal weakness here in the first quarter. They've had some supply chain disruptions, uh, you know, in the, the European supply chain with the Red Sea. They also had this fire in, in Germany, um, you know, that, that shut down the factory for a little bit and, and the announcement that uh, they're kind of trimming some of the, the production in China. And so I don't think anyone has any big expectations for production here. But what is at stake, I think, is, is where the margins shake out for the quarter and how that sets up for the balance of the year. And, and so as we're looking at this, we just trim numbers on the on the first quarter just, you know, to, uh, out of a bit of caution. But we're also seeing them recognize a, a certain amount of deferred revenue with the release of uh, the uh, version 12.3 on the FSD. Uh, we think they're going to recognize a reasonable amount of revenue there to support the margins. And so, uh, you know, net net where we're at is we, we think there's um, a bit of a, uh, you know, better than fear trade setting up here on the quarter, uh, provided that the margins hold up as we get into the balance of the year. I mean, the bigger Car question really is, you know, where are the normalized margins going forward? Right. And so so with that in mind, it all comes back to some of these pricing dynamics and, and how that correlates within the mechanisms that that Tesla is actually able to demand or generate demand here at this point, too. Um, you know, as you think about some of the other adjustments that they're going to need to make, are they going to need to make other production adjustments given the demand environment here, too? I mean, one of the things that this company has been really great at is making ongoing, uh, you know, cost uh, cost optimization choices, and so they've they've continued to drive cost out of the vehicles on an ongoing basis over the over a number of years, and so we think they continue to do that. They've got some benefits from uh, you know materials on the lithium side that that are still yet to fully roll through. We think they're continuing to um, beat up their suppliers on components, and then they continue to be in the Western world still the the largest uh, the EV OEM. You know, the, the question for me right now around um, you know where they're selling is is how much they're going to sell into the Chinese market where there is this very aggressive price war, and how much are they going to start uh, you know shipping a number of those vehicles into other uh, countries in Asia and, and a number of the under underserved countries that they they really have not been um, selling into but do have a sales footprint. In. And speaking of China, the competition is heating up. There, Xiaomi releasing an electric car that's actually four thousand bucks cheaper. Then the Model 3, given the price wars that have been heating up and already are heating up in China, how much more pressure could something like this be or, be, or put on Tesla sales within China? You know, it, it's we're going to find out here. I mean, I think they've, they've reached a, a solid baseline. And the real challenge for this company is to grow at scale, right? I mean, they're, they've talked about growing at 50 percent a year. Obviously, this year is going to be a, a, a different story with something more akin to or more like 20 percent growth. And we think they're making a very big pivot. And this is what we highlighted in our note earlier this week, that they're moving into the recurring revenue or software driven sales uh, process here. And we think this FSD release coupled with the one month trial that they're they're pushing out into uh, into the U.S. market is a, is a very big deal for them to move from being a hardware maker to a full full solution provider, and and we'll see how um, mature this uh, this FSD really is. There's been some mixed reviews out uh, on the internet with uh, the functionality, but there there could be a potential uh, embrace of the functionality as, as folks start to look at how um, the, how the vehicle drives as it mimics humans in in a more substantial way than a lot of the other folks working on uh, on full self-driving. Well, and within that kind of services realm for Tesla, they've had to continue to moderate lower the pricing for FSD. Is FSD fairly priced at, at this level right now? There's obviously a lot of price discovery happening right now on, on the functionality. And so, you know, when you look at, you know, kind of the value of, uh, you know, a, a mile driven, you know, just on a cost basis, you know, you're, you're kind of right around a dollar uh, a mile in terms of the cost of ownership for a vehicle. Um, you know, when you layer in someone's time, uh, depending on how you value that time, you, you add on another dollar or so uh, of total value. And so how consumers really engage with that, um, that value proposition, you know, the, the convenience of being able to multitask in their vehicles 
or just have a little bit more safety in the cars uh, is really um, you know TBD at this point. I, I think as we get into uh, what's you know termed level four, level five self driving, we can really legitimately take your hands off the wheel and let the car do the driving. I think there's a lot of value there, uh, and so thinking about this kind of twelve to fifteen thousand um, dollar upfront payment, it doesn't seem unreasonable. You know, the two hundred dollar a month subscription fee over the course of time actually adds up to substantially more than that. Uh, and and I think we're we're just testing the market right now for the first time, and, and we're going to find out a lot in the next year. Colin Rush, who is the Oppenheimer Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst, thanks so much for taking the time here with us. Thanks for having me. Certainly. Well, coming up, Netflix is on a tear this year, but one of Wall Street's most bullish analysts is pulling the stock from its best ideas list. That analyst joins us on the other side of the break. Are you still watching? Netflix is a big winner in the first quarter of the year, tracking gains of more than 20% and outperforming five of the seven members of the Magnificent Seven. Well, Wall Street is bullish on Netflix with two thirds of analysts rating the stock a buy. Our next guest has been, has been one of the most bullish price targets on the street and is nevertheless removing the streamer from a list of best ideas. Here with more of the analysts behind that call is Alicia Reese, Wedbush Securities Vice President of Equity Research. It's great to see you here. So removing Netflix from the best ideas list, do you still, though, it sounds like, see upside for Netflix? And what does that look like? Yeah, so I, you know, we did. We raised our tar target even more. We're still very bullish on the stock. We just don't expect the same outsized growth in the shares that we saw over 2023. I think what we're going to see is a, a shift um, to some extent from um, subscriber growth in 2023 that was really outsized. Some, a lot of that driven by the password sharing crackdown and the ad tier as it's limited churn. We think the ad tier will continue to limit churn over 2024 and beyond, um, but it'll also start to, in the back half of the year and certainly into 2025, contribute to ARPU. And I think the story shifts from a subscriber growth story domestically to an ARPU growth story domestically. Um, that, you know, subscriber growth should still, you know, maintain um, some really nice, um, you know, a buffer from the international growth still. So we're still quite outperforming on the stock. We just don't see the stock doubling again in 2024. Yeah, you mentioned international. What levers do you expect Netflix to, to try and pull 
uh, in the back half of this year, at least, well, <laughs> in the next three quarters of this year. My goodness, I'm just trying to, you know, speed past the second quarter. But anyway, as we think about the rest of this year, what levers can they pull internationally? Well, they, I think they have still, you know, our survey that we did recently said that about 6% of at least domestic um, Netflix subscribers are still sharing their password and have not yet been cracked down on. And so I don't think Netflix is going to do that all at once. I don't think you're going to see that in one single quarter. They're they're trickling that in because it's adding, you know, a nice buffer um, for new, uh, new subscriber additions for those who get kicked off and also for families who choose the extra member feature. And that's a nice boost to ARPU. So I think we'll continue to see that just in you know in diminishing rate um, that we saw in 2023. Um, there's also the ad tier. The ad tier is nearing accretion. So that incremental ARPU that you get from the ad tier, it's you know it hasn't um, you know added anything to ARPU yet. It's reaching parity. I think it'll in the back half it'll start becoming accretive, and then in 2025 it'll be more meaningfully accretive, and that can grow pretty substantially um, beyond 2025. So it's still a really interesting story here, um, and there's um, quite a bit of growth um, in all aspects. And then, like you said, the international that um, you know just growing the subscriber base. I think there's not as much room, to, you know, in EMEA, um, but certainly plenty of room left in Latin America and APAC. And what's that going to do to uh, Netflix's bottom line, do you think, Alicia? Yeah, so the ad tier um, accretion, that drives revenue, that drives um, earnings, that drives free cash flow. Um, so that's that's a hugely positive story. You know, consensus is calling for a, a doubling of um, EPS from 23 to 25 or 26. Um, and, and we think that's absolutely reasonable. Um, a lot of that is just coming from you know, the extra member feature being in, in, entirely incremental revenue and then, um, you know, uh, the accretion from the ad tier being entirely incremental revenue and at a very high margin, you know, they're not spending, you know, terribly much on that. And as they add more sports and more sports like content like the WWE, that'll give them a lot more opportunity to advertise and not just on the ad tier on the you know premium tiers as well. How much more do you expect them to spend on unscripted content, whether that be sports or whether that just be acquisition of uh, or licensing of shows that are unscripted and just do popular and, and do well? Yeah, I, I mean, they're going to follow the trends. Um, and so if people want unscripted content, they're going to buy unscripted content and try to buy the best unscripted content. I think right now they have a really great balance of, you know, buying um, licensing content from the other, you know, um, studios and just getting a really good combination of that and their original content and um, tinkering with sports without spending too much. I think they're doing a really good job of getting their feet wet, figuring out what works. But until they ha really have a robust advertising system, it doesn't make sense to go full force into sports yet. Um, but I, you know, expect that down the road. All right, well, they've already got a couple documentaries that have done pretty well for them, so we'll see how that continues to perform and where they spend further into sports as well as other genres. Wedbush's Alicia Reese, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Coming up, we'll be taking a look at the sports betting names following an announcement from the NCAA, which hit them hard on Wednesday. We've got more on that after this break.
DraftKings still moving on news out Wednesday that NCAA President Charlie Baker is pushing to ban college proposition betting, a.k.a. prop betting, saying that the NCAA is trying to halt prop betting to protect student and professional athletes from threats and harassment. Investors wondering how much this is likely to impact the stock. A J.P. Morgan analyst saying this morning that investors could take advantage of the dip since DraftKings is unlikely to see any meaningful headwinds stemming from a potential ban. You're taking a look at shares of DraftKings. They are up right now by about 1% here. The tournament continues to roll on this weekend and the championship into next week as well. Yeah, Nahu Finance reached out to DraftKings. They did not have a comment on this at this point, uh, telling us to reach out to the American Gaming Association for further details. But when it comes to the bottom line impact of this, maybe it's not material as of yet, but you talk about the widespread adoption of online sports betting, how quickly it has become popular as you talk about further legalization. And given the fact that college sports are such a part of the culture already across the United States, so many people who are massive fans who, who do participate in online sports betting obviously watch collegiate athletes, watch these college games, especially March Madness, where there certainly is more and more activity, it seems like, on a yearly basis. So if we do see any sort of turn, any sort of change in the ability to make prop bets uh, for college games, you would think that it would have an impact on the business. The degree, though, to that impact is clearly something that analysts are still trying to figure out at this point. Yeah, and it, and it comes at a time where there's been a mind share change as to how college athletes are able to monetize themselves. And I think yeah. what this is doing is really pointing towards how that kind of that wind change has really meant, okay, the mentality is I, I might work with, um, you know, different entities and organizations who I think have my best interest in mind. I think what the NCAA and their argument is trying to do here is ensure that they're not getting approached by wrong entities and saying, okay, well, here's where we could, you could make a, a quick buck or anything like that. Trying to shield them from that um, and not alleging here from this seat, at least, that there's any unethical activity that's already taking place. But I think that's what they're trying to get ahead of right Yeah, here. certainly. We will be following this story as it develops. Well, coming up, right, it's time for you to leave this set. You got to go prepare for wealth. That's at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Next hour, Massive Mills will be joining me here at the desk. Brad is going to join you guys again at 11 a.m. Eastern time for an all new edition of Wealth. We got much more of your market action ahead. Again, you're looking at gains right now, actually, across the board. The S&P and NASDAQ just above the flat line. We'll be right back. We did it again. We'll back
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Madison Mills. We're just about 30 minutes into the trading day, and we have some breaking econ data out right now. First, let's get to consumer sentiment. University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index just released, coming in better than expected, rising to 79.4 for the month of March. This is the final reading for the month of March. It was risen from the prelim reading of 76.5. The index reaching the highest level that we've seen since July of 2021. Looking into this report, some of the commentary that I want to pull out for you. One, consumers are now broadly in agreement that inflation will continue to slow both over the short term and the long term. Now, expected change in median prices during the next year fell to 2.9 percent versus that 3 percent reading last month. And also this is uh, worth pointing out here. The share of consumers spontaneously mentioning the upcoming election. No surprise there. It rose to nearly 20 percent. That, that was up from just 13 percent last month. So more and more consumers paying closer and closer attention to the upcoming election in November. Now switch over to the February pending home sales data that we also just got out. The latest reading on the housing market, pending home sales rising to one point, rise 1.6 percent on a month over month basis. That was slightly better than what the street had been expecting. They were looking for a rise of just about one and a half percent. NAR chief economist Lawrence Yoon, who actually joined the program earlier this week, he wrote in this release that ongoing job gains are clearly increasing demand along with more inventory. Now in the Northeast, though, we did see a drop of about three tenths of a percent in the Midwest. So pending home sales were up 10.6 percent on a month over month basis in the South. It was up just about 1.1 percent in the West. However, it fell there off about six point six and a half percent on a month over month basis. Maddie. Well, Sean, I want to take a quick look at the market action here, because given that better than expected consumer sentiment data, it does seem to me like we're going to have a little bit more upside throughout our day. But we're seeing not a ton of action. The S&P up about a tenth of a percent. The Nasdaq and the Dow Jones basically unchanged here. That is further in the green than we were seeing earlier this morning. So could be an indication of those consumer sentiment numbers kind of fueling a little bit of optimistic reaction. But we might see that kind of fade as we get into the latter half of the day because we are at the end of the quarter. We've got quarterly rebalancing coming in. That could be something that leads to a little bit of profit taking as money managers start to try and get a little bit of something to say to their clients as we head to the end of the quarter here. So interesting to see what the movement is. We're still seeing the Russell up about four tenths of a percent here. So we're seeing a little bit of that broadening in the market. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, though, because U.S. consumers feeling a little more optimistic, obviously, given those numbers. Numbers. The Consumer Sentiment Index, as a reminder, registering a reading of 79.4. That's according to the University of Michigan, and that is above the street's expectations, which were at 76.5. We're also looking at the one-year inflation expectation coming in at 2.9 percent versus the three previous readings, the previous reading rather, which was 3 percent, and that is below last month's data, showing consumers are hopefully starting to feel a bit better about the trajectory of inflation. Here with more, we have Laura Cooper, BlackRock Senior Macro Investment Strategist for iShares, EMEA. Thank you so much for being here, Laura. Is this good news both for the markets and the Fed this morning? I think it is probably good news because it essentially just continues this string of strong economic data that we have seen. And certainly markets are reacting in kind to that. Because I think when we look back to what we heard from the FOMC last week, it does suggest that the Fed is willing to live with a higher degree of inflation and yet still follow through on the easing cycle starting probably in the middle of this year. Now, we did, of course, have some comments from Waller that suggest that so long as this data does continue to surprise to the upside. Perhaps they're going to delay that a little bit, but I think this is not a material enough change. I would think the inflation print tomorrow is probably going to be more of a signal that leans still towards the Fed, still potentially cutting. If not June, then certainly I would suspect by July. Laura, if we don't get a rate cut in June, what do you think that immediate reaction could potentially be for equities? Well, we have seen a little bit of pairing back of the odds of that June cut. So we were about 80% before the Waller speech, and then we, that kind of subsequently fell to about that 60% mark. So there is scope for that to be further priced out. So a bit of a knee-jerk reaction at the front end of the U.S. curve would potentially take out some of the steam from the U.S. equity market. But I think overall, this is still a market that is being driven by relatively strong fundamentals. Central banks are poised to cut rates 
economic activity in the U.S. continues to remain strong, and then overlay that with what's happening in earnings. If we look at earnings expectations across sectors in the U.S., they are all expected to post positive 12-month es estimates. So I think it's quite still a favorable backdrop for equities, really in the absence of a clear catalyst. Potentially, tomorrow's inflation print could be kind of a knee-jerk reaction if it does surprise strongly to the upside. But I think we would need to see a few of those upside inflation uh, surprises come through for the Fed to materially deviate from its current policy stance. Well, on that data we're getting tomorrow, Laura, what does the data we've gotten in so far, particularly with CPI and PPI, tell us about what we might be able to expect tomorrow? Well, I think the data so far does suggest that inflation is coming in a bit hotter, certainly, than, than the Fed would uh, be comfortable with. But we did have Powell last week suggest that they do expect the inflation print for the, the PCE to come in you know, below that 30 basis point mark tomorrow. The market's expecting the core gauge to come in about 0.3 percent, so below that that kind of 0.4 percent print that we saw yesterday. But we need to see you know, sequential month-on-month -month prints show further other signs of slowing for the Fed to be comfortable that it's going to have inflation back on that sustainable path to 2%. So it does suggest that even if the Fed does start cutting in July, if it get more comfort on the inflation front, you know, this is going to be a very gradual easing cycle. And I think financial conditions you know, are still easy. The, the, the battle for the Fed will really be trying to maintain this kind of hawkish guidance to try to keep uh, rates restrictive so long as this economic backdrop continues to be remain as as resilient as it has been. And Laura, right now, when you take a look at the GDP number that we got out this morning, yes, it is backward looking, but pointing to exactly what you're saying, the fact that the economy, once again, remains resilient. We see another quarter here of strong growth. So what does that then tell us for leadership? Because we certainly have started to see more of a broadening out in terms of that leadership, financials, energy, industrials, among the outperformers for this year. Are we going to see more of a rotation into that trade? I mean, our base case at this point is that we are going to see some further broadening out of the U.S. equity market performance, but still we think tech leadership is going to continue to dominate. I mean, yes, we've gone from the so-called magnificent seven now to the fabulous four, but ultimately those are still going to be driven by this kind of secular demand driver of artificial intelligence, which we expect to broaden out. And so the earnings support that tech backdrop. If we look at what 12-month forward estimates Estimates are for EPS. It's about 17 percent. Now that may seem a bit high, but it's actually in line with historical averages. And we think that that's the sector where expectations for earnings can actually be met. Now, if we look at other pockets of the economy, you know, we are seeing some of the opportunities in certain cyclical exposures. So industrials remains one that's favorable. Our highest conviction call right now is actually U.S. banks because it is trading exceptionally cheap, about 15 times on a on a PE basis relative to the overall all index about 20 times. So it's still an attractive opportunity, even with the Fed cutting rates. You know, yields are expected to remain higher than higher for longer, certainly than what we saw pre-pandemic period. So Laura, to put a bow on it here, if your thesis is basically <laughs> that things are good, there's a little uncertainty, but we're probably going to have some momentum furthering us through the rest of the year, what is the biggest thing that investors should be doing? What trade does that perspective initiate? I really think it's about looking for kind of having a defensive tilt in portfolio, so taking on that tech position, but as well looking at healthcare. We think healthcare, you know, valuations are not stretched, positioning is light, it's getting kind of the demand boost from this aging population, which is already starting to play out now in terms of some of those key innovative drugs that are coming through. And then finding some pockets of opportunity in U.S. equities, looking at some of those cyclical exposures, given the robustness of the U.S. economy. So looking at financials, looking at industrials, and even energy, we think, are, are their pockets. I think the key risk to watch for is just essentially whether we see this resumption of, of upward price pressures, which could lead the Fed to keep policy on hold for longer. But I think that's kind of looking for the diversification across the portfolio. Really, now's the time to continue to, to look for those, those key allocations. All right, Laura, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to join us here and for your insight. Laura Cooper, BlackRock's Senior Macro Investment Strategist. Thanks, Laura. Well, coming up, Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Zazi sat down with GM CEO Mary Barra as part of our Lead This Way series. We will dive into that interview next.
our vision is to create a world with zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. I think a crisis is the time you really demonstrate to the entire team you're going to live your values. 2024 is really a critical year. The leader of one of the largest automotive companies in the world, General Motors CEO Mary Barra has her work cut out for her. Over a 100-year-old company, GM is facing a turning point in an industry racing into the future. From her early days as crisis manager to her recent change-making goals, Barra has made some big bets on where she intends to take the company. She promises to double GM's revenue by 2030, transition GM's fleet to be fully electric by 2035, and to have GM become the leader in autonomous vehicles within the next five years, overtaking Elon Musk's Tesla and thwarting longtime rival Ford. After being skeptical for some time on Barra's transformation plan, investors have started to kick the tires on shares of General Motors. We met with Barra at GM's Global Technical Center in Warren, Michigan, where we were given rare access to tour the campus in a new E-Ray Corvette. She reflected on her bumpy start at the helm of GM, the corporate culture shift she was forced to initiate, and how she plans to convince hesitant investors of her bold vision for the future. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Let's rock and roll. Yahoo Finance had the opportunity to ride shotgun with Barra inside a new E-Ray Corvette, a car that required Barra and her team to take a gamble with a total redesign of the classic American sports car. She says it showcases what she believes will be the future of GM, electric vehicles. Will those moves translate into shareholder value, though? Despite previous headaches with EVs like the Bolt, Barra seems to think so. You're making bold bets uh, on EVs. You have... Oh, great number of EVs, you, you envision an EV future. Uh, how do you deal with some ones that maybe haven't worked in the past? You know, how do you deal with that, that feedback from the team and, and even shareholders? Well, I think first just be transparent and be honest. Uh, with a company of this size, and again, when you're in the midst of the transformation, you know, we're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn what works, what doesn't. Uh, we're going to learn uh, what the customer really wants. Uh, and so I think you just have to be nimble and not I mean, the worst thing you could do is stick with something when it's when it's not working, and you, you know you find out there's a better way. And so, you know, we we learn and we make changes. What did you see ten years ago that drove you to this conclusion that GM needed to be all electric by 2035? Well, I think you know if you go back to EV1, I mean, GM in, was ahead of its time, and and so we never stopped working on EVs and battery technologies in 2010. We came out with the Volt, uh, which is, was an extended yeah, range electric yeah. vehicle, and then the Bolt in the 2015 time frame. But then again, as we really started to look at um, climate change, uh, really started to understand where the regulatory environment was going, that's what led us to do the Ultium platform where we could really provide, um, you know, be able to do vehicles faster. We are the Although GM's revenue grew by 10% from the prior year, 2023 didn't come without challenges, as the company was forced to take a $1.1 billion production loss as a result of the UAW strike, something it's now carrying over into 2024 as it doubles down on its EV bid. It's been a challenging six months for the, for the auto industry, or if not the longer, given the strike, the UAW strike. What did you learn as a leader going through that process? We knew uh, that it was going to be uh, a, a very important negotiation. You know, clearly there was new leadership in the UAW, and we were just learning each each other and had different priorities, so we had to do a lot of problem solving. So it was a difficult time, but we got through it. I've been involved in labor relations in one sense or another uh, for 20 years. And our employees that are represented, and we have to talk and understand, you know, again, sometimes we have different priorities, but how do we find the solution? Because we have to do what's right for the employees, but we have to also have to do what's right for the company, because without the company, the employees aren't going to have the job. From her early days inspecting fenders at a Pontiac plant to becoming the first female leader of one of the big three automakers, Barra has already honed her leadership chops in a variety of ways, both intended and not. We took over as a CEO of GM at a very tough time, it just follow, just following the, the bankruptcy uh, of the company. Is there a different playbook to lead during a crisis? Uh, I think a crisis is the time you really demonstrate to the entire team you're going to live your values. 
you know, you're going to, you know, do what you've been saying. It's easy to do the right thing or it's easy to do live your values when everything's going well. But really showing them, you know, when it's tough, we're still going to do the right thing. We're still going to live our values. We're going to focus on the customer, uh, all of that. I think that's what you've got to demonstrate. And, and when you do, it becomes much more ingrained and people go like, OK, yes, I get it. They're committed. And that's so important when you lead a team the size of General Motors. Was it really important then to be visible and vocal? Absolutely. We needed to over-communicate. Uh, and, and we did. Um, not only myself, but several leaders. You know, one thing that happens in a crisis is you, you learn you have an issue, but it happens, depending on what it is, over the next several days, several weeks, sometimes even several months, of what really happened. Barra never really had a choice about being visible or vocal. One of her first tasks in leadership tests okay. was navigating the company through one of the most high profile and damaging recalls to hit a major automaker. I am deeply sorry. Sorry not only for what happened, a faulty ignition switch that led to over 200 injuries and more than 100 fatalities, but for the internal culture that allowed a decade to go by before defective vehicles were recalled. A 325 page report made public after an internal investigation found a culture at GM that lacked accountability and ownership when it came to safety issues. The recall and internal investigation into how the company failed to address problems sooner forced Barra to change the siloed culture at GM to ensure an epic communication failure can never happen again. How did you go about changing the culture at GM within those first six months on the job? Well, you know, it was, it was a really interesting time because everything was being written. You know, Mary Barr, can she change General Motors culture? The federal government today hit General Motors with the biggest fine ever levied on an automaker, the maximum penalty for failing to sound the alarm about a serious safety defect. And not everything in our culture was bad, but, uh, and I kind of it's a little bit daunting because when you read about culture change, people say it takes five years. What is a culture? A culture is what people think of the company. You can't fake culture, but what you can do to start changing the culture is change the way you behave. So as a senior leadership team, we said, okay, we're going to start living and demonstrating these behaviors. And if we aren't, we're going to respectfully call each other out. Thanks, Thank you very much. Thanks for what you do. This is so important for the company. Thank you. Changing and adapting how a company the size and scope of GM behaves is no small feat, something Barra addressed with the ignition switch debacle, but is now addressing again in a different way, the company's future. I gave it enough acceleration. We're out of stealth. What do you think this car represents about your leadership? First, you know, when you talk about mid-engine, that was a vehicle that had, you know, been discussed for years. Finally, we, we believed that we had taken the Corvette as far as we could and that we needed to move to a mid-engine. And so it was a big commitment because it was a big investment. How do you ensure that these risks pay off? We look at you know, decisions on what product we're going to do, what features we're going to put in the vehicle. You know, we, we put a lot of thought into how we do that. Uh, we do customer research, but then some, there's some things you can't research because sometimes it's, uh, you know, you just have to go with something you believe is going to be so spectacular and different and excite the customer. The latest iteration of the iconic Corvette is certainly emblematic of going with something spectacular and different. The question is whether it and other efforts will be spectacular and different enough to convince consumers and shareholders that GM can go from American revolution to American evolution. Investors have put GM stock in the show me category amid volatile earnings reports the last few years. GM shares trade at a massive discount on a P.E. basis, not only to the market, but relative to its highest profile rival, Tesla. GM stock is also trading at a big discount to what its own hard assets are worth, things like real estate and factories. Even a $10 billion stock buyback plan, something GM announced in late 2023, is a big sign that the company itself thinks its stock is undervalued and will be worth more down the road hasn't yet won over all the naysayers. What is the most important thing you need to execute on to win over shareholders? Well, we clearly have to demonstrate that the Ultium platform allows us to have a portfolio of profitable EVs that customers want to buy, critical. That we have software in our vehicles that uh, enables a better customer experience, an easier customer experience, uh, and surprises and delights. And then that we uh, craft the um, the future path for cruise. I mean, I, I really think it comes down to doing those three things well while delivering the financial results uh, and, uh, you know, doing the right thing for our, our owners, our shareholders.
which means not doing everything at once. That includes decisions like pausing all autonomous vehicle activities at the end of 2023, when one of GM's cruise robo-taxis ran over a woman, causing injuries. GM revealed the self-driving unit is under two federal investigations into the incident. Barra also announced on GM's latest earnings call, the company is cutting spending on the cruise division by $1 billion. Despite recent setbacks, Barra is still committed to an autonomous driving future. Where do you see GM in five years? I'm working hard to make sure we're leading in electric vehicles in the countries that we operate. Uh, I'm uh, also very focused that we have software that creates a whole new customer experience. And then uh, autonomy, uh, you know, when you think about self-driving vehicles, it really takes us to a safer place. Our vision is to create a world with zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. And I hope people in five years say they've done that and they're in a leadership position because of it. While Bauer remains hyper-focused on keeping GM not only profitable but relevant, enrolling in the 21st century, she still makes family a priority in her life. And yes, she tries her best to unplug at night. I think every leader is different, but for me, I do need a little bit of a break because I think that, you know, gives you, um, it allows you to have a fresh perspective. And I think you need to, you know, not... You're still doing emails every day. You're 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 always on call. I think is really important to get that break to get a to just you know. I've many times I've woken up with a fresh perspective. A fresh leadership perspective that Barra hopes keeps a legacy automaker like GM competitive and successful in the uncertain years to come. How important is 2024 for GM? 2024 is really a critical year because this is a year of execution. And we really, you know, we need to demonstrate and, you know, we're on track now. We had some challenges last year with building battery modules to put into the packs. Um, you know, we're on our ramp plan now. I'm really proud of how hard the team has worked. So this is a, a critical year, also a critical year for software. We have really brought in a new software team from Silicon Valley last year. And they've made a lot of change to improve how we develop software, to improve how we validate software. So this is definitely a year of execution, but I'm confident the team can do it, and I'm excited to show the world what we can do. Such great access there. Well, shares of GM are up 31% in the last year, trading at a 52-week high as the auto giant remains committed to its EV strategy. GM CEO Mary Barra telling Yahoo Finance that it's one of the most important priorities for GM that they need to execute on for shareholders over the next few years. Well, her comments come as demand for EVs do wane a bit, weighing on startups and legacy automakers alike. Joining us now in the Yahoo Finance newsroom, our very own Brian Sazi. And Saz, that was so interesting, great access, a different look that people, that viewers don't typically get here of GM CEO Mary Barra. Talk to us just about what you've learned. We heard Barra saying that this is a critical year for GM and their plan here to really push the foot or better position the company for the future. Well, two quick shout outs. First, uh, thank you to the General Motors team and Mary Barra for doing this. Uh, I assure you her gig is not to spend a whole day with me taping <laughs> interviews. So uh, she is a busy person. So thank you to her. And of course, thank you to the Yahoo Finance team. Uh, the work this place is doing is, is absolutely mind-blowing. But nonetheless, very important point, I think, in towards the end of that uh, feature on the valuation on General Motors. And people wonder, well, why is the stock trading about five times forward earnings? The market is hitting new records. Uh, most other stocks are trading over 20 times. It's because of what I saw in that General Motors factory. This is a company, and Ford for that matter, mm. undertaking a major transition to electric vehicles. And to spend the day in these factories to see how intricate and how much complexity is involved in doing this, for since uh, you've been making gas cars your whole entire life to change production facilities, to retrain workers, it's going to weigh on profits. But General Motors is, I think, doing a lot of things they need to be doing to make this transition uh, a profitable reality. They're cutting expenses. I think they've designed their cars better to make these more profitable EVs over time. They're starting to roll out more EVs, so they're making these things at scales, which should bring costs down. But overall, and this is a couple of my uh, takeaways for, for General Motors as people, investors are digesting this, and lastly, uh, my point is this, you know, Mary Bauer remains the right leader for this pitiful time uh, for GM. And, you know, in our research on, on Bauer going into this, really, she started working at a Pontiac plant inspecting fenders at the age of 18, following in her father's footsteps. She has the engineering chops. She has really uh, incredible respect of most, in fact, not all the tight teams uh, at General Motors. So again, a uh, really fascinating story for GM. Did she say something about taking a break towards the end? 
She is not taking any breaks. Uh, for her, I think she finds time to unplug Madison with her family. She made a point that despite the high pressure cooker nature of her job, she's always found time to make uh, the appropriate time for her family. But look, I mean, like with any CEO gig, I mean, these are 24 seven uh, jobs and this is a very, very difficult uh, job, especially for a company or a leader like at GM when you're trying to just change. Look at those facilities, how intricate they were. I love were. the shot of the two of you what, walking and, together. And right, and what you didn't see off camera there is the new $300,000 Cadillac Celestique, and it's just a bespoke car being built by hand. I, who else is doing that uh, in Autoland? It's just phenomenal. But this is a company, I think, that is very focused on taking their fight to Tesla. And lastly, I should mention this, go watch the extended cut over on YouTube. But what that essentially means, a little more Asazi and a little more Mary Barra extended cut on YouTube. There you go. <laughs> All right, Sazi, thank you so much. Yeah, Amazing piece. Thank Great you. job appreciate to you it. and the team on that. We're going to have all of your markets action ahead right here on Yahoo Finance. Stay tuned for more. First, Medicare Health planning to pay for the weight loss drug Wagovi. Now, programs run by CVS, Elevans, and Kaiser extending coverage for the drug to patients with certain heart conditions. For more on this, I want to bring in Yahoo Finance reporter Anjali Kamlani. Anj. That's right, Shauna. Really good news for these companies and uh, the companies specifically with Govi from Novo Nordisk getting coverage by these employers, uh, by these insurance companies. And that's after uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services last week opened the door after the FDA, I know this follow the chronology here, the FDA approved uh, or rather expanded the label for Wagovi 
to allow based on a study showing uh, positive results for a heart condition. So CMS said, you know, they can they have issued the guidance stating that these anti-obesity medications, now that they've received their approval, can be considered a Part D drug that is covered. So the question then became, who is going to jump on board? CVS has confirmed that they are doing it, as has Kaiser Permanente, who says that the coverage of the weight loss drug with heart for members with heart disease is effective immediately. So that is already in effect right now. Meanwhile, uh, the Wall Street Journal also included Elevance in the list. So we'll definitely be waiting to hear and see from them. But what this does is basically opens the door for greater use of a drug that is already high in demand, already costing insurers a lot of money, and was basically inevitable in terms of where it was going to go. Now, we also know that other drugs are being tested for this name. Eli Lilly, ZepBound. So if they do also get that expanded label for heart disease, we'll see even greater, broader coverage, and we'll have to see what other insurance insurers jump on board. All right, Anjali, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it, as always. We're going to continue talking about Walgreens because shares feeling a bit of pressure this morning. Despite beating the street's expectations on the top and bottom line, the drugstore chain posted a steep net loss for its fiscal second quarter and narrowed its fiscal 2024 guidance. That's amid a more challenging retail backdrop. For a deeper dive into the company's latest results, we are joined by Brian Tinkielet, Jeffrey's Healthcare Services Equity Researcher. And Brian, thank you so much for being here. I want to start by getting your reaction to this earnings print. Uh, good news in there, but ultimately we're trading on the bad news today. What do you think is the single biggest thing that Walgreens needs to turn around from this earnings print to have a better quarter of earnings next next quarter? Yeah, good, and good morning and thanks for having me. So first, you know, to your question, obviously they, they put up an above consensus or above street uh, Q2 EPS. But if you back out the impact of tax, I mean, they still beat, right? And as you said, that they narrow the guidance for the uh, for the year, which implies a back half, kind of like EPS run rate in the you know kind of like annualized in a two sixty eight to two ninety eight two dollars and ninety eight cent range. Now, if you think about where street estimates are for twenty twenty five for fiscal twenty five, it's at three dollars and fifty cents. So I think the reaction here is realizing that. The, the out year estimate for Walgreens is too high and that street numbers need to come down based on what the run rate of the business is as we get into their fiscal uh, second half. Now, the other thing I think that was interesting is just the fact that they called out the weakening, a weakening consumer environment. And that's one of the reasons why they narrowed the guidance range down. So um, obviously a lot of concern there because we, we, you know, we're not sure what that means and how long um, it will impact earnings uh, and, and tra foot traffic and, and just sales on the front end of the store. So those are probably the key highlights here. And then maybe to the part of your question, what do they need to do? You know, one of the things that management announced today is that they're conducting a strategic review of the different assets that they own and that they've bought over the years. And so I think we want to see them maybe monetize some of those assets or maybe even reduce um, some of the clinic uh, footprints that they have, which are currently losing money. So, uh, you know, there are certain uh, moves that management can make here over the next few quarters, for sure. So, Brian, when you talk about the potential for a further reduction in clinics, talk to me about why that strategy makes sense, given that the fact that they're still seeing pressure in other parts of their business as well. Yeah, so what it is is that they've built these clinics. I mean, they, they bought a company called Village MD. And Village builds clinics, right? And so they have more than 300 clinics or had um, around the country. And the problem with the clinics is that they lose between one to three million dollars a year um, on the front end in the first few years. And so if you just run that math, you know, it is a lot of losses that that Walgreens has had to eat over the last you know couple of years. And so as management tries to shore up the balance sheet, improve cash flows, improve profitability. This is one of the, of the big sticking points where you, you know, they're looking at saying, do we really need to invest this much into a physician clinic strategy that is actually not even located in our stores anymore? So they've shut down pretty much all the in-store clinic locations. So the synergy of that strategy is now being you know, reviewed by management. And, and part of the key here is that there's a new CEO, new management in place. So they're not married necessarily to these assets and strategies. Do you like the new CEO for the future of the company? I think Tim, you know, is a he's a seasoned healthcare executive. 
Um, he's been in the pharmacy supply chain uh, for a long time. He came from you know the PBM space with Medco and Express Scripts before they got sold, and then now he's at um, at, at Walgreens. And I think you know he's he has a track record of being a very good operator. Now you know the challenges that Walgreens faces today are probably different from what Tim has seen in the past, but you know I think he's got the right team around him to really you know evaluate what the right move going forward is. I think the only challenge here is time. Um, you know, some of these moves that we're going to have to make will take a lot of time before we really see the impact in terms of like an inflection in earnings performance. Brian DeKeelit, uh, always great to get your insight. Thanks for joining us here. Jeffrey's Healthcare Services Equity Research. Thanks. Thank you. And keep right here on Yahoo Finance for more on the company's results and also strategic plans going forward. We will hear from a Tim Wentworth, Walgreens Boots Alliance CEO. He will be joining Yahoo Finance at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time today alongside Anjali Kamalani. You won't want to miss that. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. What's dark, sweet, and currently seeing better year-to-date returns than NVIDIA? Well, guess what? It's cocoa. You see it right there on your screen. Cocoa prices climbing once again this morning after breaking record highs earlier this week, briefly surging past a 10,000 level here. Now, prices have more than doubled over the last year, following 10 years, or three years, excuse me, of poor cocoa harvest in two countries that produce nearly 60% of the world to cocoa. So where do prices go from here? We want to bring in Philip Schriebel, Blue Line Futures, a chief market strategist. Phil, it's great to see you here. So talk to us just about the massive run-up that we've seen in the price of cocoa. How much of that has to do with fundamentals? How much of it has to do with some of the technical levels that we're seeing? Yeah, and this is a story that isn't just developing year to date, being up 140%. This is something going back one year, we're up 250%. So the story really, resulted in less demand from COVID-19. So the producers, they reduced the size of the crop that they planted. And then when the consumer began to come back into the playbook and people started to spend more money and everything, the Russia-Ukraine conflict had begun in Russia curbed their exports of fertilizer and pesticides to the Ivory Coast. And really what that did was it put the plant at risk. So you follow the adverse weather, the poor crops, the diseased trees, the increasing demand with the recovery in the economy, prices tended to spiral out of control and created this short squeeze. So the producers, they couldn't keep up with the demand because of the crop being so poor. So they canceled all the forward contracts that the end needs are 
the end user really needs. Um, so the cost just spiraled out of control. They couldn't get a hold of the supply. Well, I'm curious then about what the catalyst would be for prices to get a little bit better for the end consumer here. Uh, what would that look like and what might the timeline to that look like? Yeah, that's going to be a problem. So, and I mean, you start looking at how it's impacting different companies. So you go back to like May 2023, price of cocoa was $2,900 a ton. Now we're trading closer to $10,000 a ton. It's cost more for a ton of cocoa than it does for um, copper, for instance. And you look at something like Hershey's stock a year ago was at $294. Now it's only at $192. So that's really been impacted. The problem is this deficit is one of the largest since 1960. So what really needs to happen is, you know, the exchanges need to stem and curb some of the speculation that's going on in the markets. We're seeing the average price fluctuate about $400 a ton uh, on a given day. So that's $4,000 for every contract move for a regular speculator. So what some of the FCMs are doing and what some of the exchanges are doing is they're raising those margin requirements there. And right now it costs about $15,000 to control one contract. So some of the speculation has got to come out of it. You need to see a better crop over uh, in West Africa, and then you need to see some of that demand really come down. So it's a combination of things that probably won't get resolved anytime soon. Phil, talk to us about the impact that this is going to have on consumer, what the impact it's going to have on companies that rely heavily on cocoa. When you're talking about prices right around 10000 per ton, what does that trickle-down effect look like? We were thinking about that earlier on, you know, if you're someone who produces things like chocolate bars and things, we were, we were looking at what are the components that are going into it. You're going to have milk prices, you're going to have sugar prices, you're also going to have your labor, your debt costs, and everything else going into it. So hopefully that some producer is maybe getting the benefit of lower milk prices, also labor prices have come down. But the problem is, is at some point in time, it's going to be you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and when do cocoa prices continue to go up and really squeeze profitability. So that's why I think we're seeing stocks like Hershey really under pressure when you look over the last couple of years. Well, they're under pressure, Phil, but it's not just because of cocoa prices. There's another elephant in the room when we think about any company that's involved with snacking, and that's Ozempic. So I'm curious from your perspective, what's worse for a company like Hershey's, Mondelez? Is it cocoa prices or is it Ozempic? I could tell you, I know a lot of people that are on Ozempic, they're hearing some great results out of it. And one thing that it does is it really does curb, you know, your appetite and any of those excess things. You tend to eat more like, you know, like like a squirrel, you're eating nuts and berries and basic things. So, <laughs> you know, that's really going to take that demand down and it won't even impact not only like cocoa, but like the alcohol industry, any kind of snacks and things like that. You're really going to see that demand come down quite a bit. So this is a this is a play that's going to take out a, take a while to go through. So if you look at 8,500, the level on on cocoa, and it's trading right around 9,700 right now. If we broke to that level, technically we would see some kind of breakdown on the charts. We would maybe go back to a neutral trend, but you really got to get the excess speculation out of it. Philip, really helpful. Thank you so much for joining us on that, and appreciate the squirrel reference as well. Philip Strebel, Blue Line Futures Chief Market Strategist. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're going to have all of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned right here for more. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
There is no doubt that I would not have found the success that I have today without TikTok. TikTok has made me a better teacher. It's helped me to connect with people far beyond my classroom. Think about the 5 million small business owners that rely on TikTok to provide for their families. What you just saw was TikTok's new ad campaign, the social media platform, aiming it at senators, urging them to vote against a House-passed bill that could ban the popular app. Here to weigh in, we have Yahoo Finance's Akiko Fujita. And Akiko, thank you so much for joining us on this. This isn't the first time I've seen an ad like this while on the TikTok app for 10 hours every day, um, but it's taken a lot more of a serious tone. Yeah, when you think about before the House introduced this bill, you saw some of those ads, right? TikTok sort of showing a little patriotic side, if you will, yeah. to appeal to American users. But this certainly points to the fact that TikTok is digging in their heels, showing no signs of backing down as lawmakers call for the platform to be divested from its parent company or Chinese parent company, I should say, ByteDance, or risk being banned. As you guys just mentioned, this time running ads targeting battleground states and vulnerable Democrats. The $2.1 million ad campaign shows users talking about <clears throat> how the platform has helped their livelihood. You've got one user saying there are 5 million small business owners who use the platform to provide for their families. And then another one saying we have to make enough noise about this so they don't take away our voice. Those are their words. And this is all part of the platform's pressure campaign to rally its 170 million users against lawmakers who are calling for the divestiture. And we've spoken to a number of influencers here at Yahoo Finance who've said, look, we have reached out to TikTok to say, we are ready to fight for you. Now, the House, as you guys mentioned, has already passed this bill. The president has said he would sign the bill. But the Senate has made it clear that they're not in a rush to try and get this passed, which is exactly why we've seen this platform, TikTok, going after senators specifically. Now, CNBC reporting TikTok has placed ads in Nevada, Montana, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. That's according to data they cited from Ad Impact. And those are states where there are vulnerable Senate Democrats who are fighting for another six-year term. And the thinking here is, of course, you've got 170 million users, many of them very young, right? And if you can rally those users to go out and vote, then maybe senators will think twice about pushing for this. So that's the strategy, at least for now. But we've heard a number of senators who've come out and said, look, we do agree with the premise that there's concerns around this platform because of its Chinese owner, but we're not necessarily comfortable going with a the, the House bill and the language there. So could be a little drawn out. Yeah, so Kiko, speaking of it being drawn out on this a pathway, uncertain, obviously, uh, to say the least, within the Senate, what does that process then potentially look like? Any idea of the timeline? And then when you talk about the backlash, you also got to think about the upcoming election, what it could mean for President Biden versus Trump, who's recently changed his tune about all this. Yeah, I mean, not even President Biden. We're talking about these Senate Democrats, yeah. right? And that sort of seems to be the strategy here. I mean, if you think about what we've heard from senators, those like Mark Warner, as well as Maria Cantwell, they've said that, look, there is a national security concern, but if you pass the House bill as is and you target one specific company, that opens up a whole other can of worms, and what does that mean ultimately? So it feels like that's kind of where the discussion is happening. The question is whether they're going to draw this out until it yeah. moves past the election, it's still to be determined how significant an election impact could be because, yes, they've got a lot of users that are young, but those voters don't necessarily always turn out. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good point. All right, well, a story that we will continue to watch here very co closely. Kiko, thanks. Well, we are expecting the sentencing of disgraced FTX founder Sam Bankman fried later on this morning. His fate will be determined in a Manhattan federal court by Judge Lewis Kaplan. Joining us now with the latest is our very own Jennifer Schomburger. Jen. Shauna, as we await sentencing of Sam Bankman fried he is currently speaking in the courtroom right now, reportedly saying that he hears what victims are saying and agrees with what they've gone through. Uh, he says that they have been deprived of gains and they have been waiting for their monies for a year and a half. He says he threw away what he had built and that he let everyone down. He says, quote, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about what happened at every stage. Things I should have done and said. I, sh I care about everything too. 
quote, I made a lot of mistakes. Now, victims are also speaking out in the courtroom. One reportedly flew in all the way from London. Victim Sunil Karuvi reportedly telling Judge Kaplan that, quote, Sullivan and Cromwell has trampled over our property rights. They've liquidated billions of dollars of crypto assets. There's a token that sold at 11 cents. It's now trading at $2. FTX had $10 billion in Solona tokens that they sold at a 70% discount. Manhattan federal judge uh, Lewis Kaplan, who is presiding over this case, uh, reportedly saying in the courtroom last hour that he found that Bankman Freed gave perjured testimony at the trial, that he falsely testified that until the fall of 2022, he had no knowledge that Alameda had spent FTX customer funds and falsely testified that he had first learned about the $8 billion loss in October of 2022. Kaplan saying, quote, a fortuitous run up in the value of some cryptocurrencies bears no relation in the gravity of the crimes that were committed. A thief who takes his loot to Las Vegas and successfully bets is not entitled to a sentencing reduction, even if pays back. So all of this, Shauna, insinuating we could see a very harsh ruling again, standing by for that actual sentencing here. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much for tracking this story for us. We're going to continue to follow it, of course, throughout the day. Thank you so much. We're going to do a final check of the markets here. I'm just taking a look at the major averages. Seem barely green on our screen, basically flat movement. I also took a look at volume. It's looking like it's down about 20% versus the 30-day average. So this shortened holiday week, maybe some folks taking that vacation a little bit early here uh, and we'll really be monitoring that PCE report coming out tomorrow as well. That could lead to some change in the futures market. We've got our new show, Wealth, dedicated to all your personal finance needs. Brad Smith has you for that coming up in the next hour. Stay tuned.
wealth. Earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. On today's show, planning for retirement, why the 60-40 model might not work for you long term. And a joint bank account might seem smart, but maybe it's not always the right move. Plus, should you max out your 401k or are there other accounts you should fund first? All of that straight ahead. Welcome to Wealth, everyone. I'm Brad Smith, your favorite glasses, jacket, shirt man. And this is Yahoo Finance's newest guide to building your financial footprint. Our community of experts will give you the resources, the tools, the tips, and the tricks that you need to grow your money. Your wealth theme for today, retirement planning. We look at some of the best strategies for that next stage in your life, from the 60-40 portfolio mix to whether or not you should max out your 401k. We've got you covered. It's time to get retirement ready. For years, investors have relied on the 60-40 rule as a guiding principle for securing their financial futures. The idea is that you allocate 60% of your investment portfolio into stocks for growth exposure, with the remaining 40% towards bonds to help provide a stable income stream, just in case stocks underperform. And while this may be a time-tested strategy, it may not fit your personal retirement goals. For more on retirement saving, I'm joined by Brooke May, who is the Evans May Wealth Managing Partner. Great to have you here with us this morning. So first and foremost, we got to talk about the general rule of thumb here. Who should and who shouldn't consider this type of 60-40 portfolio? Retirees are, are those moving towards retirement. It's not a bad way to go. Um, if you look back over the last 10 years, the 60-40 portfolio hasn't worked. When you've got 40% of your portfolio allocated to fixed income, and fixed income returns have been very low single digits, it's been tough to make money with a 60-40 mix, even though equities have done well. That said, moving forward, we think it's different. When you look at fixed income, you get principal appreciation when yields go down. So as the Fed comes in and starts to cut rates, bond yields will come down, which means the price of those bonds go up. So investors right now can get four and a half, five percent on corporate bonds, and they very well could get some principal appreciation over the next few years. So that 40% allocated to fixed income isn't going to be the drag on a portfolio that it was over the last 10 years, where we saw bond rates in the in the one, two, three percent range. Certainly. So, you know, another thought around this is the efficacy of a 60-40 portfolio hinging on the actual number that a person or a household needs to save or has kind of put out there for retirement in their own planning? Not necessarily. We make, at Evans May Wealth, we make the mix dependent on the individual's risk tolerance. We have clients that are in their 70s and 80s and are perfectly comfortable with an all equity allocation. We have clients that are they're younger and have decades before they retire and they lose sleep at night whenever the market takes a downturn. So we we allocate clients stocks and bonds really according to their to their comfort their comfort level with equity volatility more so than where they are in in, the, in that stage of their life. What does 6040 look like after the Fed's rate cutting cycle here from your anticipation? We're optimistic on equities. We think that we're not necessarily going to continue at the same pace we've seen the last few months. But by end of the by the end of the year, we think equities will be higher. And then if we can get a few percentage points in fixed income from the appreciation and the um, and the income, we think that a 60-40 balanced portfolio could return 6 or 7% this year, and really along those lines for the next few years to come. What is a good benchmark? What is, what is a good number to kind of base that against? You said 6 to 7% returns. What is the target that a lot of people should have? If we look at the S&P 500, that's a great benchmark for the equity piece. And if you look at the 10-year Treasury, 
that's a good benchmark for the for the fixed income piece. So when you look at those long term averages, you can you can allocate them according to the percentage and the weighting, and that's how we're deriving that six to seven percent return. So and I mean, we're taking a look at the S&P 500 right now, and this is just a past five day view. But of course, money, many of the goals that have uh, been set forth by some of the institutional banks out there, firms uh, and the targets that we've seen come in very lofty for this year uh, and, and moving indeed here. Thank you so much for taking the time here with us today. Certainly do appreciate it. Brooke May, who is the Evans May Wealth Managing Partner. Thanks. Well, retirement savers, listen up. You still have time to make contributions that may lower your 2023 tax bill. And even better, bump up your retirement savings account. While most tax saving moves wrapped up by December 31st, guess what? There's still ways that you can save. Yahoo Finance reporter Carrie Hannon is here with the breakdown. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Brad. Well, here's what you need to do. If you have not made your contribution to your individual retirement, your IRA, you have till the 15th to do it. And this year you have 65. Carrie, we're going to try and get the audio and video uh, squared away for you. We'll be right back with those tips from Carrie. Stay tuned. Retirement savers, listen up. You still have time to make contributions that may lower your 2023 tax bill and even better, bump up your retirement savings account. 
While most tax saving moves wrapped up by December 31st, there are still ways that you can save. And Yahoo Finance reporter Carrie Hannon is all over this one with the breakdown. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Brad, great to be here. Yeah, if you haven't made your con contribution to your individual retirement account, your IRA, whether it's a Roth or a traditional IRA, you have until the 15th to put $6,500 away in that account. It's lopped right off your tax bill. Or uh, if you're 50 or older, you can put in an additional 1000 So I think this is a fantastic way. You know, the traditional, you're going to get that tax deduction right away. With the Roth, you're going to pay the tax going in, but coming out, you're not going to pay that tax. So that's your choice, but that's your deadline. You also should consider adding to your health savings account if you have one. If you're in high deductible plan last year in 2023, you can set aside up to $3,850 in that account. Or if you're doing a family plan, seven. Thousand seven hundred and fifty. And what I love about HSAs is they're a triple tax advantage. You don't pay tax going in. You don't pay tax on the in, uh, the as it increases in value, or when you take it out for medical expenses. So invest that account if you possibly can. And finally, by all means, if you're getting a tax refund, don't go shaking your hands and saying, "Hey, I'm going to spend this." Why don't you take that money and put it right into one of your individual retirement accounts, your IRA accounts, and you can do that straight from your 1040. Kerry, thanks so much. Excellent coverage and breakdown. Uh, we know that you've got much more on the Yahoo Finance platform as well. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brad. Absolutely. Getting retirement ready. A 2023 bank rate survey finds that 56% of Americans feel behind on saving for retirement. Even moreover, around a quarter of workers have not made retirement contributions in at least a year. So how can we help? We've gathered a panel sharper than a number two pencil to provide some context around financial planning for retirement and some tips to help you along. Joining me now on set, we've got Midland Financial founder, Lawrence Sprung. He's known on the interwebs and by his friends as Larry. He's also the author of Financial Planning Made Personal. Also with us virtually, we've got Kerry Carbonaro, who is the Advisors Capital Management Senior Vice President and Director of Women and Wealth. Thank you both so much here for taking the time. We have to know, first and foremost, right off the bat, because it sounds like there are a lot of people, and Larry, I'm turning to you first, a lot of people that have not taken some of those steps, some of them very easy, but for different reasons one way or another. What is the first step, first way that they can get back into the proper type of retirement savings cadence? You have to get started. If you're one of those people that has not started yet, get started. Do research on the internet if it's something that you feel comfortable doing on your own. And if not, contact an advisor, even a, a fee only hourly, just to get some advice and guidance so you can figure out what you need to do to get on track for yourself and your family. Carrie, I want to bring you into this as well. I mean, when clients come to you, what's the first question that they're asking about where they can set up that retirement planning? So most clients that come to me usually have something via work because if you have a 401k or a 457 or a 403b, you usually get matching contributions and that is free money. So I tell everybody, please take advantage of that. And I always say step one is to max out your current retirement account at work. And if you don't have one, you can always set one up or you could do an IRA, but no matter what, you have to set it up. It has to be on autopilot because that's the way most people save. If, if you're given a choice, you won't save it. It's called behavioral finance. So you have to get it in and get it often. And that's the way to get you to your goal. Certainly. Now, Larry, it was interesting. I was reading one of the recent blog posts that you had at Midland Financial talking about the benefit of the power and benefiting from the power of tax loss harvesting. First and foremost, just explain that to us. Yeah, so tax loss harvesting is taking a look at investments that you may have losses in and taking those losses and using them to offset gains. Because at the end of the day, it's all about how much money you're able to keep, not after selling the investment, but after you pay the tax man. And by selling some losses to offset those gains, you end up keeping more of your hard-earned money and the growth that you've accumulated within those accounts that are outside of retirement accounts. And Kerry, I mean, this is a really interesting time, specifically as so many people filing their taxes and, and retirees, they're trying to figure out the best way and the tips and tricks that they can employ for themselves. Is there one top trick that's different this year than years past? 
Well, I love my favorite tip and trick for my retirees is what's called the QCD, which is a qualified charitable distribution. So if you are forced to take your required minimum distribution and you don't need it and you are already gifting to charity, and especially if you're not itemizing, because a lot of seniors are not itemizing anymore, you can have that required minimum distribution go directly to the charity. Then the charity wins. You win because you don't have to pay taxes on it. And really, everybody wins but but the tax man. <laughs> yeah, uh, everybody's looking to score a W against Uncle Sam. So, you know, at the end of the day here, Carrie, as well, you know, you look out into the future and you think about the number of people that are also going to be bringing in, whether it's millennials and, and how they're planning for retirement and starting to figure out, okay, where we need to set up for our kids and where we need to make sure that even in this entire equation, we have enough for ourselves as well as making those around us. What is the, the biggest shift that you're sensing over this past perhaps year or a few where millennials are coming into some of those peak earnings years, but also thinking forward to what retirement looks like as well? Yes, it's interesting. Millennials are starting to really save. And I have a lot of millennials that are maxing out their 401ks, which I'm super happy about. But another, another thing that I do with my clients is my clients actually set up and fund Roths for their children, for their adult children. And that's been super helpful because every year, um, sometimes they don't even tell the children, but they set up the Roths. And it's a great way to build um, tax-free income for your children over time. And I mean, and I'm talking adult children as well. Certainly, I mean, Larry, when we think about <laughs> early retirement, I mean, is there a common misconception that, that pops into your mind about early retirement and how can people avoid those pitfalls? Yeah, I, I think one of the misperceptions is that it can't be done. People have this conceptual idea that they have to work till 62 or 65, some retirement age that's kind of been created for us. And it's just not true. If you start early enough, invest wisely and make right and smart financial moves, you can retire much earlier than those preconceived retirement ages that we, we all think about. Larry and Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time here with us today. We appreciate it. Well, Sam Bankman fried the founder of Collapsed Cryptocurrency Exchange, FTX, is being sentenced this morning. The proceedings are currently underway. He is appealing his conviction from this past November, being found guilty of several counts of fraud and conspiracy. Prosecutors are currently asking for Bankman fried to be imprisoned for 40 to 50 years. The judge presiding over the case, Judge Kaplan, says he found investors had lost over $1.7 billion. But what are the chances that people could see that money come back? Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schoenberger to give us the details. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Brad. Uh, as Sam Bankman fried awaits his sentencing, Manhattan federal judge Lewis Kaplan making comments last hour in the courtroom saying, insinuating that victims are not likely to be paid in full. Kaplan saying reportedly, quote, the assertion that customers and creditors will be paid in full is misleading. Defendants equate loss with a dollar volume in the bankruptcy case. He went on to say, for the reasons well articulated by Mr. Ray, Mr. Ray being the current caretaker CEO of FTX, that people will be paid back is, quote, speculative. Now, this coming after lawyers for the defunct ex exchange told a Delaware bankruptcy judge uh, back in January that the plan was to repay FTX customers in full and that that was, quote, within reach. Victims speaking out in the courtroom this morning, reportedly one flying all the way from London. Victim Sunil Karuvi reportedly telling Judge Kaplan that, quote, Sullivan and Cromwell has trampled over our property rights. They have liquidated billions of dollars of crypto assets. There's a token SNC sold at 11 cents. It's now trading at $2. FTX had 10 billion in Solana tokens that it sold at a 70% discount. So Brad, all of this showing that victims haven't had access to their own funds, regardless of whether they're going to be paid back their original deposits. And it also shows that the assets have taken a major haircut during the bankruptcy process. Uh, I also want to just mention that Sam Bankman Freed said moments ago in the courtroom that he was very sorry and that he empathized with the victims. Brad? Jennifer, we've got that live shot that we're going to continue to cut to. 
as the proceedings are taking place and the sentencing is coming. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for breaking this down for us. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, health is wealth, and we'll dip into the latest out of the healthcare sector. Walgreens narrowing its outlook amid a challenging retail environment. We're joined by the CEO next. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Walgreens handedly beating earnings and revenue estimates in the second quarter, but narrowing its adjusted EPS guidance for 2024, warning of a challenging retail environment. Tim Wentworth, Walgreens Boots Alliance CEO, joins me now alongside Yahoo Finance's healthcare reporter, Anjali Kamlani. Great to have you both here with us. First and foremost, Tim, I was looking through the earnings report. You mentioned the benefit from higher branded drug inflation and strong execution in pharmacy services. I think a lot of people out there right now are trying to figure out for themselves where inflation still is and isn't present in their patient experience especially with regard to the healthcare system at large. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, it's great to be here with both of you. Um, you know, in terms of inflation, it's, it's not as straightforward maybe as, as folks would think. And as much as drug inflation has actually been pretty reasonable this year, uh, so for patients that are in high deductible plans, they haven't seen massive increases. New products have come out very expensively, and that's a different, uh, different challenge than the actual underlying inflation. And then in the front of our stores, you know, we have we have seen, you know, some inflation still. But I think the real dynamic is that the totality of where the consumer is today 
is challenged, particularly our consumer. And so they are shopping for value. They are looking for, you know, best deal. They're willing to bulk purchase their shopping and so forth more than ever. And so from our perspective, that means we've got to find ways to deliver value to them because they are very sensitive right now to pricing. Tim, Anjali here, really good to see you. And I know that you're really shifting how you're thinking about the way you run these stores. You're giving a lot of uh, really um, awards and, and incentives to the local level, to the store managers. You want them to take control. Meanwhile, there's pressure on the front of the store, as you mentioned in the earnings call with uh, not just inflation, but in general, pressure coming from a long time. And so shifting how you're thinking about managing things, uh, you also mentioned something that I thought was interesting, which is looking over at the UK and the way Boots is now allowed to have the pharmacist prescribe for seven med, uh, indications. I thought that was interesting because it's something that we see in the rest of the world doesn't happen here in the US. How does that help considering you also have a shortage of labor in that area? How are you making uh, looking at all of these things combined? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big question, obviously, and I, I, I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, the way you laid it out is in such a way, but let me really go right to the most important question. We actually have today uh, really good pharmacy uh, staffing, and we have really good relationships with both the pharmacy schools and the communities. Uh, we went through certainly a challenging time, and we had to make some adjustments over the last couple of years as it relates to pharmacist hiring and retention, but we like where we are now. But we're not gonna get to where we need to simply by being a place that can hire lots of pharmacists. It is about work redesign. It is about taking the lower value work off the table. If you think about Boots, for example, and what we talked about there, you know that's pharmacists operating at the very top of their clinical ability, uh, being able to diagnose and then as well actually dispense and treat a patient that has a UTI or has a number of these other uh, uh, conditions. And so from our standpoint, whether it's our micro fulfillment centers, uh, whether it's same day delivery or same hour delivery in 80% of the time and other things to move as much work off of the pharmacist's desk as possible, making them able to take on these other more high order, more value for the system uh, opportunities. That's going to be the way that we're able to essentially grow our underlying clinical side of our business while at the same time building trust with patients. Tim, are you still looking for a buyer for Boots? So we've never said that we were looking, I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a process that Boots was in. Uh, where we are now is that we are looking at every asset we have in, in our portfolio, every one. Uh, and inside of some of those assets, we're looking at some of the sub assets even, but we are looking at every one of those to determine what is the best place for it, given our future. And that place may be in our book of business. It may be in our book of business with a partner. It may be that we find a better home for it that's not inside of our company. We haven't, we haven't discussed Boots specifically, but I can tell you that Boots is certainly uh, on the whiteboard as one of the assets that we need to have a complete understanding of how do we get the most value in the future for that fabulous, fabulously performing asset. Tim, you also have some experience with PBMs, going back to your old uh, stomping grounds. So talk to me about how you're playing with them now, considering nationwide there's a squeeze on them, there's a lot of pressure on how PBMs operate, and pharmacies historically, especially smaller pharmacies, have been complaining for years that the playing field is not fair, and they've, we've seen closures uh, for the past several years. How does that uh, really affect what you're doing? You know, the way, the way I think about it, maybe it's a bit contrarian, is um, that whole environment, and more importantly, maybe the underlying drivers of that, which is consumer patient dissatisfaction with the way the system works, to some extent payer dissatisfaction with the way that the system works. From, from my perspective, I view that as an opportunity to sit down with the PBMs and actually help them find a way to create additional value for the marketplace, additional transparency, um, additional clarity for, for, for the consumers. And so we're having conversations with the PBMs that are very constructive as it relates to not just traditional rate, but rather what's the form of the future. And I know folks have talked about cost plus as one way of kind of describing that, but what's the model for the future that's gonna help a PBM help its consumers uh, feel that the benefits that they have are valuable, that they're getting what they deserve, that they're working with a good company, that their employer provides good benefits. And I think those are all things that we can actually be quite helpful. So when I see the PBMs kind of under the microscope, um, I don't celebrate. I say, how can we help? How can we actually take uh, the current model and make it better? And we are willing and able and actually 
love to work in an environment where we are paid for the services we provide very transparently. Uh, that's the way vaccines work today, and it works very, very well. Um, but to do that in, in the, uh, the drugs and in the specialty market, where again, I think by building trust, we can get a whole lot of other patient outcomes that are gonna be good for the system. You know, Tim, we were talking to our viewers about, about health is wealth, of course. We, we toss that around a lot. But for those who are trying to figure out the right spend profile into their healthcare savings accounts or, or spending accounts, rather, or some of the other spend accounts that is tied to where Walgreens can capitalize, where have you seen that mix shift a little bit recently? And what are the anticipations there? You know, uh, you get some annual stuff where the first part of every year, folks have a reset of their uh, of a lot of their out-of-pocket deductible things, and so they suddenly go looking to, you know, hopefully find the money in those accounts to to bridge them through to when their insurance coverage will start once they've reached those those hurdles inside their plans. This year has been no different in that respect. Uh, the flip side is, uh, you know, also. You know, our own, because patients are value shopping. Even if they're sick, they'd rather not overpay for a particular over-the-counter uh, cough, cold, and flu uh, uh, remedy, for example. And so what we see is the uh, number of own brand things that come off our shelves that are paid for by HSA's accounts are continuing to increase as patients use those, those dollars to keep themselves healthy and, uh, and or make themselves well. And so, you know, and I do, I'm, I'm a big believer that health is wealth. I think the most important thing is for folks that have those accounts to have to spend as little as possible today because then they can compound the growth of those accounts and, and hold the money for, as they age for, for the really catastrophic things where they may need it. Tim Wentworth, Walgreens Boots Alliance CEO alongside Yahoo Finance's healthcare reporter, Anjali Kamlani. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you. Coming up, everyone, it's never too late to start retirement planning. We'll break down what accounts are available to you, plus the top tips, tricks, and trends to build the retirement nest egg just for you.
there are often a few steps that couples take when they're in a relationship, moving in together, maybe getting a pet, little furry friend, and thinking about children, non-furry friends. Getting a joint bank account? Oof, yeah, that wasn't your thermostat rising. It's just that hot of a topic here. Yahoo Finance ran its own poll and the results are clearly mixed here. Nearly 32% say they have all joint accounts. 30% say they have both joint and separate and 38% say they have no joint accounts. Ooh, spicy. So, could joint accounts be the right thing for you? That's the big question. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Molly Moorhead to break it down further. So let's start with what a joint account is for our viewers who might not already be privy to this and this, this debate. The spicy debate. Yes. <laughs> so uh, a joint account is a regular bank account, could be checking or savings, but it has more than one owner. Usually it's two people, could be more. Um, but the important thing to understand is that it's not half and half. It's not I own half and you own half. We all, we both own all of it. Uh, so not really shared in that sense. So walk us through the pros and cons as people are deciding for themselves joint bank accounts or not. Um, a big pro is transparency. So if you and your partner have an account, uh, you can both see what's coming in, what's going out. You don't have to wonder where did that $200 go. <clears throat> it's all there for everybody to see. And that can make things simpler if you're uh, if you live together, own a home, you're managing those expenses. Uh, an easy way to do that can be out of a jointly held account. Uh, on the other hand, that transparency that's a plus to some people uh, might, might make others uncomfortable. I don't want you seeing all of my Starbucks runs, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and so if, if you want to maintain some privacy, one thing I like is the approach of have a, sh a joint account for shared bills and then keep your own account on the side that's just yours. I'll be totally forthright and say I know exactly where that $200 went. It went towards a DeLorean Lego set. Um, but anyway, <laughs> how about a checklist to know <clears throat> if this might be the right account alignment for you? Yeah, some good uh, situations, very common, like we talked about, couples who are kind of merging their lives mm. get a joint account. Uh, but then also a good one is a parent of a child, maybe a preteen or a teenager who's learning to manage money. A joint account gives that kid some spending power, helps them learn about uh, money management, but the parent has oversight. Mm -hmm. And then um, lastly, if you have an aging parent, if you're an adult child of an aging parent who maybe just can't manage their money all on their own anymore, this is a really good um, arrangement with some safeguards in place and uh, a lot of people find that helpful as their parents are getting older. Molly, thanks for laying out the parameters here and the decision-making process that many people are going through with a joint bank account. Thank you so much. You bet. Absolutely. Well, age ain't nothing but a number. That's why it's never too early or too late to begin preparing for retirement. But there are so many options once you get started. Do you need a 401k or an IRA? What does that Roth mean? And what do you have to do once you open the account and start contributing? Here to break this down for us as part of our Simple Finance segment, we've got Ross Mack, Maconomics founder and personal finance expert here with us. Ross, let's start with the basics. Traditional IRA versus a Roth IRA versus a 401k. Break down the difference between them. I love breaking this down because at the end of the day, right, more than half of Americans don't believe that they're gonna be comfortable and ready to actually retire. And so one, you just gotta get right into it, right? And so the big difference between all three of these is one, understand that they're all tax advantage investment accounts and they're gonna differ on when and where they're taxed. They're also gonna differ on employer contributions as well as some of the investment options. And so when you hear anything traditional, right, whether that's a 401k or a traditional Roth, I'm, I'm sorry, a traditional IRA, just understand you're gonna be taxed on the back end, meaning that you're gonna have tax advantages on the front end, meaning that money's gonna be able to come out of your tax. I mean, I'm sorry, money's gonna be able to come out of your check and that money's gonna be invested. However, once you make your withdrawals and that's qualified at 59 and a half, that is when you will be taxed. Now, when it comes Comes to a Roth IRA, one here you obviously have more investment um, options, but your money's going to go in after tax. So literally, you're thinking about I've already paid taxes. Now I can make contributions to my Roth IRA, and then once you take that money out at 59 and a half, that money will not be taxed. Now. Some people open a retirement account and just leave it sitting there. What's the next step that really gets your money working for you? I love that. So nine times out of 10, right, when you have a 401k, 
the average person doesn't know what it's in, right? Um, nine times out of 10, it's just gonna be in a target date fund. Now, when it comes to a Roth IRA, that is your own individual retirement account and you yourself have to open that. And I've had people talk to me and say, okay, I opened up a Roth IRA, I put money into it, right? I wired it, and I actually don't know what's the next step in there. That money's just sitting there. Your next step is now, what I recommend, is putting that into an index fund, most commonly an S&P 500. And so should you max out then all of your retirement accounts every year? I love that question. So here's the thing, right? When it comes to the order that I believe any individual should do is first things first, if you work at a corporation and you're lucky enough to get a 401k match, meaning your employer is going to match you dollar for dollar up to a certain threshold, I want you to max that amount. So whether that is 5%, say you make $100,000 and your employer is going to give you another five, you know, 5,000 to your 5,000, max that out. However, after that, my next thing that I want you to do is actually take your next threshold. So when it comes to maxing out, I believe every individual should try to invest roughly 15% of their annual take home pay. And so uh, when it comes to the next step after you match up to your uh, employer's match, the next thing I want you to do is put the rest of that, your target into a Roth IRA. And so, you know, at the end of the day, like an actual match for a 401k is roughly $23,000. It, the average person, in order to do that, they would be making over 150000 in order to have a target of 15%. So no, I don't want you to max out every type of retirement account. Every individual is going to be different, but try to have a target of roughly 15% of your annual income. And from there, you kind of work backwards. And once again, if you have a 401k, I recommend literally putting, you know, whatever your employer is matching you because that, at day one, guess what? You're literally getting a 100% return. Then after that, the next tier I want you to do is a Roth IRA. Now, if you don't have a 401k, then you obviously go to your Roth IRA and the contribution uh, limit there is roughly $7,000. And then after that, you can go back to either your 401k or just a traditional IRA. Certainly. Ross, thanks so much for teeing up this conversation. There's a lot to continue to discuss here. Ross Mack there really setting this up for us as there's a lot of differing advice out there when it comes to saving up for retirement. And for young people, it can get really confusing really fast in some cases. According to a Fidelity study, on average, Americans have saved only 78% of the amount that they'll need in retirement. So how do you get started? Let's go to square one here. Joining me now is Tiffany Aliche, who is the is known as the budget nista yes. as well. We should also mention she's a personal finance education, uh, educator and author. You see the book there on the screen. New book, Made Whole, The Practical Guide to Reaching Your Financial Goals. Tiffany, great to have you here in studio with Good us. Good to be here, Brad. Our, our friend Ross Mack. Uh, actually, That's my friend too, just yeah, so you know. Uh, our collective friend, <laughs> Ross Mack, advises against maxing out your 401k. And you seem to agree to some extent here. So what are the levers that people can pull prior to maxing out that 401k? Before thinking about maxing out your 401k, because it might not be realistic, $23,000 is the, the max for 2024. Okay. So a lot of people don't have that. The average American is making less than $60,000 a year, right? So you want to ask yourself, one, do you have proper health insurance? Maybe you want to save for a down payment on a home. Maybe you have high credit card debt that you want to focus on? Do you have life insurance if you have a family? There are other things. Plus, the 401k is not the end-all, be-all when it comes to retirement accounts with tax advantages. There's also a Roth IRA. Have you considered that? So consider those things before max maxing out. But what you want to do, Brad, for sure, is whatever, whatever your company matches, mm -hmm. make sure you at least get that match. That's the free money that's owed to you. Okay, get that match. And that's the second time that we've heard that in today's show. You know, when you think about beginning retirement planning for some who are just entering into the full-time workforce yes. in their 20s, that conversation starts then. So how can people that are even in their 20s start to begin their retirement plan? Especially in your 20s because yeah. time is on your side. Isn't that how the song goes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? So one, you want to start now. It doesn't matter how small the amount, start now. And when you're 20s, I want you to create the habit that the more you make, the more you start to set aside. So every time you get a raise and an increase to your income, you're gonna set aside more. In your 20s, it's also a good time to practice asking for advice. Mm. If you have a traditional 401k at your, at your job, they almost always come with a financial advisor attached. Call them, reach out to them, and leave your money alone. Don't touch it, because if you allow it, compound interest is really gonna set you up for retirement. What's the one thing that you wish you could tell your 20-year-old self about retirement, if you could go back and do things differently? Well, honestly, I would have told her that like, 
One, when I first started, I didn't realize I actually had to choose my accounts, that I had my money sitting in a money market account for longer than I knew. Because, you know, the money, you say, yes, take out this much money a month for my check. I didn't know, like, past that, girl, you have to make a decision where it's going to go. So it was there for a couple of years before I actually chose my accounts, and I lost out on that earnings. So that's what I would tell her, like, to not just start now, educate yourself, see it through, ask questions. We, mem we, we mentioned from the study from Fidelity, how many people do not have enough set aside for retirement? What can people do if they don't have enough or make enough to set aside for retirement right now? And honestly, that's gonna be so many people. So one, whatever you can set aside, set it aside. You're also gonna wanna really look about increasing your income. Can you, we hate to hear the word side hustle, but what other things can you do to make more money? Can you budget a little better? Maybe there's some expenses you can get rid of so you can put more money toward retirement. Also, consider that retirement might look like working for you. Hmm. You might have to work part-time to supplement your retirement income. And also, don't give up. Like, it can feel really overwhelming, but retirement can be still a pleasurable experience if you start to do something now. Okay, and just once you finally set that up, uh, that up for yourself and you say, hey, I'm ready to retire, mm -hmm. what are the pitfalls that you need to avoid once you've retired so that you can responsibly tap into the budget that you've created for yourself. So once you've retired, I want you to make sure that you're really looking at your healthcare expenses. It's one of the main expenses that are gonna go up once you're retired. And so like now might not be the time, I get it that we all wanna throw money away at our private island, but you might wanna make sure that you have enough healthcare expenses to cover whatever that's going to look like. Also too, like mapping out what life looks like. We're living longer and longer and longer. How much do you actually need? Can you reduce some expenses? Now's a great time to say, do we need this big old house? Maybe there's something smaller. Maybe we can sell this house and put that money toward retirement as well. And enjoy. You know, you work so hard. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Yeah, my private island floats, so <laughs> I'll have to work on that a little bit. <laughs> Tiffany, thanks so much for taking the time for here with me, us. Brad. The Budget Nista herself yes. here in studio and personal financial educator. Coming up, everyone, the tax deadline right around the corner. We'll tell you everything that you need to know about the child tax credit. Much more on wealth after the break. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
We've got some breaking news. FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried sentenced today. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schoenberger standing by with the details. Hey, Jennifer. Brad, Sam Bankman-Fried, a former CEO of failed crypto exchange FTX, reportedly sentenced to 25 years in prison by a Manhattan federal judge after a jury found him guilty on seven charges last fall for money laundering to securities fraud. Manhattan federal judge Kaplan, who presided over that trial last fall, pointed to testimony from Bankman Freed's former colleague, Carolyn Ellison, saying that he knew what he did was wrong and that he knew that Alameda was spending customer funds on risky investments. Kaplan saying that uh, Sam Bankman Freed perjured his testimony during a trial. Kaplan saying, quote, people need to feel it's fair or we're back to trial by combat or something like it, so punishment must fit the seriousness of the crime, and this was a serious crime. Now, the 32-year-old had faced up to 110 years in prison. Prosecutors had asked for 40 to 50 years, while Bankman Freed's lawyers had asked for six and a half years. SBF apologized this morning in court, reportedly saying, I'm sorry about what happened at every stage. This ends the saga of what federal prosecutors have called one of the greatest financial crimes in U.S. history. Once the darling of crypto, Bankman Freed hobnobbing with celebrities like uh, Giselle Bündchen and Tom Brady to politicians, uh, now used billions of dollars from FTX customers to fund his personal hedge fund, Alameda, Alameda Research, defrauding investors of billions. Again, Sam Bankman Freed is sentenced to 25 years in prison for the crime. Brad? All right, Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, of course, we've been keeping tabs on this, waiting for the sentencing as well throughout the morning here. Uh, I've got Shauna Smith, Yahoo Finance anchor of Morning Brief Plus, up back here on set with me. <laughs> Shauna, my goodness, I mean, I'm taking a look at some of the cryptocurrencies right now, just trying to get a sense of where this stacks up in the minds of cryptocurrency investors, whether they're holding crypto as an asset or holding some of the companies that touch crypto. And particularly here, I'm not seeing any significant move. And a lot of this to be expected coming into today. Yeah, I think a lot of this was expected. I think just in terms of the why we aren't seeing maybe a bigger reaction is a lot of this has already been priced in. You talk about the uncertainty, what people need to know, investors need to know before investing in crypto. Obviously, this has really been an overhang that has largely uh, been present here obviously within the crypto space more broadly across four investors over the last year. So the fact that we have some clarity here, the fact that the judge did come down and say that he is sentencing SBF to 25 years in prison. Yes, it wasn't as much as what the prosecutors were pushing for. Again, like Jen was just saying, they were pushing for 40 to 50 years. That was requested by the prosecutors. But Judge Clap Kaplan, though, sentencing SBF to 25 years in prison for the seven counts of conspiracy and for fraud charges, all stemming from the collapse of FTX, shows the severity of this situation and also obviously that these types of matters will not be taken lightly and people will not be treated uh, be treated uh, in any sort of uh, favor or special cases here going forward. So again, this really reiterating the fact that Judge, that Judge Kaplan was not uh, not at all hesitant to come down pretty hard here on SBF and go forward with that sentencing of 25 years in prison. You know, you, you think about some of the key profiles that have had massive downfalls over the last mm -hmm. year. This is just the biggest sentencing that we have seen, perhaps in, in the broader crypto landscape as of recent. You think back to Justin Sun and, and what took place with Tron, and you mm -hmm. also have to think back to ultimately where for some of the profiles that have built up themselves and, and really annex themselves to some of the largest equity market investors out there. We were just speaking with Anthony Scaramucci of Skybridge last week, mm -hmm. who was one of the other major investors, backers of FTX. He said to our own Anjali Kimlani during uh, Yahoo Finance Invest last year that Sam Bankman fried did something very malevolent. Mm -hmm. He was wishing to do evil, but was not very forthright at all about what those real intentions were here. And that's what came to light 
that's why this proceeding took place and netted out the way it has with this sentence here today as well. Yeah, and that is exactly what Judge Kaplan reiterated here within this sentencing, saying that it's not a trivial risk here, just in terms of SBF uh, what could commit these crimes again. But he was really saying that this is that he had SBF wanted to be a hugely, hugely politically influential person. And we saw the meetings that he held, the fact that he was so present uh, on the Hill before uh, this conviction, before the charges, before the collapse of FTX. So again, sentenced to 25 years in prison. In prison. Yes, this adds maybe some clarity here for the crypto space going forward, but you got to think that this will be an overhang that has some people, keep some people on the sideline now uh, for some time to come within crypto. And for an industry that's had to, in past crypto winters, move through the ICOs, yes. which is what came to mind for me, at least with Tron previously here. And then you fast forward to what else it had to move through, algorithm uh, or algorithmic stable coins. Mm -hmm. And now for this to net out the way that it has here, it's a larger question of uh, where the fanfare will continue to linger here within crypto. It certainly has uh, risen on the back of ETFs, but here, Sam Bankman-Fried, sentenced to 25 years in prison for those crimes with FTX. We'll be back with more Yahoo Finance at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.